Jay Crawford, Adam the Bull, Garrett Bush, Tyvis Powell, Jason Lloyd. Plus, ba da 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 you're loving him, Mikey McNuggets. And so many big names, it would take me hours to say all of their names. The ultimate Cleveland sports show starts now. Booyah! Hey, here we are on a Monday. It's a it's Eclipse Day. It's uh, Men's Final Four today. And most importantly, you know, for our purposes, it's the home opener for the Cleveland Guardians. Opening day in Cleveland. It was a normal commute this morning, but it's going to be packed today. G. Bush and Earl are with us. What's up, guys? What's, What's up, up, man? man? No, you guys no, ready to go? No Guardians gear? No Guardians? I, it's a major failure by me. It's a major failure by Earl. We, neither one of us wore Guardians gear. It's a terrible job. I thought y'all was going to be ready to go. For we the dropped the ball. I mean, I'm ready to go. Oh, okay, you ready I mean, to go? Okay. We dropped the ball. By the way, I, I can't imagine. And by, I, I was just thinking uh, this morning about how a 13, if I would have told the 13 year old me that I would yesterday watch baseball fine, which I did watch baseball, but I also watched women's college basketball and soccer. I was watching soccer yesterday morning, believe it or not. Really? Yes. Why? There was no other sports on. I had a, like 20 minutes to kill. I was waiting. My son and I were going to the gym and I was waiting for him to like get ready, basically. So I had like 20 minutes to kill and I put on some soccer for a little bit. And I, it was Manchester United against um, Liverpool. Mm-hmm. I can't believe I remember that. <laughs> and uh, I, I've been a little more, a little interested in soccer from because we're rewatching Ted Lasso. And I, I don't know. Anyway, so I saw, and I have no idea the name of the guy who scored the goal. But I saw one of the most incredible things I've ever seen in a sporting event. This guy on Manchester United score, scored a goal to make it 2-1. Eventually, the game ended 2-2 with a match, I think it's called. But the guy, you guys got to Google this. If we can get this video. Bull, I'm so proud of you, I just want to say. Did you, did you see this? I, I was watching it at a bar yesterday morning. But, so so you saw the goal that gave Manchester United the lead? I will go find the video for I you. I can't remember the name of the guy. I think he's, I don't know where he's from. But uh, he's, I, I, he kicked the ball. I was like, what is he doing? There's no way that can go in. And it went in. I couldn't believe it. It was like he threw a was knuckle. It, was he it Bruno kicked the Fernandez? knuckle ball or something. What? Bruno Fernandez? No, no, no. He was a, he was a black guy. I think he might have had a, an African name. I don't remember now. I can't remember. Definitely, I definitely wasn't Bruno Fernandez. It was the second goal for Manchester United. It gave him the 2-1 lead. Who was that guy? Ant's looking it up. I, I just see there's a bunch of videos of a long shot from Bruno Fernandez yesterday. Well, maybe that too. But this, this goal, it wasn't that it was even that long. It's just the way it, the ball moved. I was like, I didn't know the ball could move like that. Bend. You got that bended like Beckham. Yeah. It's crazy. But anyway, you guys look for it. But, but um, <laughs> one other thing I wanted to make note today, guys, before we get into the Guardians. Today is the 50th anniversary of Hank Aaron breaking Babe Ruth's record for the all-time home run, to become the all-time home run king, 1974. There it is. And it's a very famous video. Uh, the, the audio is also very famous, too. But remember, this two fans ran on the field. And I can't imagine what was going through Hank Aaron's mind because it's two young white guys. He was getting death threats in the mail. Obviously, there was no, like, you know, cell phones in those days, of course. But he was getting death threats. I think he got more mail in the... Now, he broke the record. It was early in the season. Mm. So, at the end of the 73 season, he had been one away from tying Babe Ruth. So, the hate mail started in, like, I don't know, the summer of 73. Mm. And he was still getting hate mail, of course, in April of 74. Apparently, he got more mail during that stretch of time. Now, a lot of people were saying good things. But even if it's 10% with hate mail and threatening you, it's pretty awful. Mm-hmm. Um, but he apparently got more mail in that stretch of time than any non-politician in American history at that point. Man, just, man, just think how it was so different back then, man. Like, yeah. <clears throat> you know, my dad, when he was growing up, like, he was a really big baseball guy. You know, he talks about that and Roberto Clemente and, and, and yeah. Willie Mays and all those guys. But he always talks about Hank Aaron hitting all those home runs. Yeah. Um, and that was funny because 
when you mention like the names of you know the people who who have hit a lot of home runs, you usually hear Maguire, Sosa, you hear Bonds a lot all the time. Yeah. You you know Aaron Judge now. Um, you know, Mickey Mantle, like you don't really hear Hank Aaron's name like that. He kind of got passed over a little bit, which is weird because when I was a kid, we, we all talked about, I mean, not that, I mean, I, I was probably like 1979, 1980 when I first started being able to like have conversations about baseball, Yeah, yeah. which wasn't that long after Hank Aaron, which yeah. is weird because 74, I don't know. It feels like it was so old, but I was, you know, I was three years old when Hank Aaron or almost three years old yeah, it, when it, Hank Aaron broke the record. It, and it was at the time. You know, steroids tainted everything, and it, it made the records for a lot of people not as meaningful. But when I was a kid, we all knew, you know, the single-season home run record. You all knew the, the career. And, like, Hank Aaron was revered, and I think he is still in the baseball community. It's just not talked about. I, I don't want to jump into, like, the, the steroid era versus yeah. not, but all those steroid dudes, like, from my generation, we yeah. all knew it. We, we knew the killer bees. BJ on Bagwell. Right, we right. knew Paul Merrill. We knew even guys like when growing up, we, we knew Don Mattingly, Wade Boggs, yeah. George Brett, all those dudes. Like, I just don't, it's weird. The, the conversation around it and trading baseball cards was, I mean, that was like that. I mean, yeah. I still got baseball cards to this day. Yeah. Like, like that was huge back then. I can't, yeah. that was a whole unique era. Like, yeah. um, I mean, it's, just, it's a shame. I don't know if steroids hurt it or helped yeah. it because we knew all the, all the steroid the people. Time. <laughs> By the way, what's interesting is, so, the, so Hank Aaron was one home run away from tying Babe Ruth when the season started in 1974. And the, the, the Braves were opening the season in Cincinnati with a three-game series. And then they were coming home. And the, the owner of the Braves, I don't know, I, can't, I don't know the name of the owner, but he did not want Hank Aaron to play in Cincinnati because he didn't want him to, they didn't want him to break the record in Cincinnati. Wow. And the commissioner stepped in and said, he's got to play at least two of those three games. <laughs> and so he played. Like, without a rule or anything. Yeah, he just said, no, he's got to <laughs> play. He can't do that. And Hank Aaron, no, no, no. I mean, Hank Aaron was pretty old at this point. I mean, yeah, obviously, yeah, he was, yeah. I think, 39 or whatever. But he played two of the first, two of the three games in Cincinnati. He hit one home run to Ty Ruth. And then this was the first game, the first, I think it was the home opener. The Braves, if I remember correctly, and uh, anyway. Will anybody break that record? Will anybody catch? Well, it's been broken. I'm talking about with the bonds. No, it. now it won't be broken. Never. Really? I don't think so. Yeah, it's kind of tough. I don't think you gotta so. you got to play a lot of years. No, I mean, like, look at Aaron Judge. How many career home runs does he have? And he's already in his 30s. So, I mean, a lot of those records are never going to be broken. Speaking of crazy records, one more thing before we get, get in the mix. This pitcher, Ronel Blanco of the Astros. This is a guy who's been a nobody, a, just a journeyman pitcher, nothing. He had he pitched a no-hitter his first start of the year, and yesterday he pitched another five and two-thirds no-hit innings before it got broken up. Going back to last year, he pitched 16 consecutive no-hit innings, which is tied for the second most since 1961 in all of baseball. And this is just like a random dude. We got figure, I, Somebody got to check him out. Yeah, maybe he's taking steroids. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> this is crazy. Mike, it's opening day. What do you got for us? It is opening day. We're going to spend a lot of time on baseball. We'll talk about the Cavs' collapse in Los Angeles yesterday. We'll talk about Deshaun Watson's comments on Kevin Stefanski, which I know has Adam the Bull. Super excited. And we got two live reports coming to you from Progressive Field on the home opener. But first, today's show is sponsored by BetterHelp. What's the first thing you do if you had an extra hour in the day? Go for a run, take a nap, read a book, show up for a friend? Well, a lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. The question is, time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and make it a priority. And therapy can help you find out what matters so you can do more of it. If you're looking to find a place to go to therapy, you better check out BetterHelp. They're here to help you, and they help you learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Just visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn today to get 10% off your first month. That is BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOn. So make sure you check them out at BetterHelp.com. Right, well, so it's the home opener for the Guardians. Yeah. But Shane Bieber will not be on the mound for the Cleveland Guardians. He How do not. you compare – the excitement we should have about this team being 7-2 at this point in the season, surpassing every expectation, but also knowing their ace, their Cy Young candidate, will not be with them for the rest of the season. Well, let's hear from – we haven't heard much from Earl so far, so let's hear from Earl first. Earl, how do you balance the excitement of opening day, the excitement of 7-2, and two, 
Shane Bieber out for the year? Uh, I'm still excited for opening day. I think Shane Bieber being out for the year sucks, but the season is so fresh that it don't put a damper on everything for me. You know, they got off to a hot, hot start, 7-2. and two. The team is hitting, and, you know, the pitching rotation, it hasn't been as dominant as we used to, but it's been good enough for us to, to get wins. How I look at it is – nice throw, Ant. How, how I look at it is, um, you know, injuries happen in sports, right? And I think that there's enough arms in that rotation that can be solid if they step up their performance. But as long as the Guardians keep having success, I think – it won't change anything for me. I, I just think I, I look at it like, okay, we're less than 10 games in. Yeah, it sucks he got hurt, but the season is so fresh that it don't, it don't put a damper on anything. Like, players get hurt all the time, so we just got to keep the train moving. Gee. You know, me for me, when I, you know, I was on the radio when the news broke, and um, I just remember being super sad uh, for Shane Bieber um, because I, I know what it is to, he's put a lot of work in, right? And he's, you know, won a Cy Young before. It's the highest level that you can you reach in your career. And, you know, he's not going to be able to recoup the benefits or, or, or to, to, to get to a place monetarily where he should be at. And so that's why, you know, sometimes when I talk about money and I get frustrated when people say, oh, you're not worth this or you're not worth that or we'll just trade them or do this. I'm like, listen, man, these people put so much time and energy and effort into the game and he was pitching so well and it looked like he was going to at least if he wasn't going to be here at least he was going to be able to recoup and get some get, get a big payday somewhere else and for him not to be able, able to finish the year and to pitch so well in the beginning and then get injured have to have Tommy John surgery and, and you know I know what it feels like to you know just have to stay you know for him it's starting all over like you know there's no, there's no guarantee that he's going to be back to where he was. There's no guarantee he's going to ever pitch again. And so for me, it puts a little bit of a damper because I would have liked to see, um, you know, Shane Bieber, a good guy, be able to take care of his family. It's not like he's poor or anything, but, you know, you just never know when you go out there. And then my thought goes to Tristan McKenzie. And I'm like, man, like, should he have had, had, had the surgery? Should have Shane Bieber have had the surgery? Like, like just to just get it over with, and they would have probably been on the, on the mend. I, some of those things that go through my head is, is just because I've been through it before, and it just brings up those feelings because I, I I just been there before. So um, that sucks. But in terms of the whole overall feel, I'm still excited about uh, you know the Guardians seven and two, and that's the the cool thing about baseball is this: it ain't like basketball, right? It ain't like football. You know when you're not about to do nothing in basketball or football. It's evident. <laughs> like, you, you come into the season and you know we ain't got a quarterback. It's a wrap. Basketball. Hey, you come into the season, hey, we just drafted a rookie. We don't got a franchise player. It's about to be a long season. Baseball ain't like that. Baseball is like, okay, let me see what you're doing. Guys can have a year. Guys can get out, get out and get hard. You can get out and get, uh, you know, you know, start the bats early. You can come in and buy guys are pleasant surprises in terms of your pitching rotation, especially get some good pitching. And you can carry you carry over energy. Like by the time April is over, you could go into May and be like, this team's just different. So I still got a lot of uh, a lot of enthusiasm for uh, the Guardians seven and two. They did a good got good job on a, on the way trip. And Steven Volt's young. I like. I want to see what he's doing. I like how he's doing things different. I think it was, everybody is still excited about a bull. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you, you said it best. That baseball, one injury doesn't crush you in baseball like it does in the other sports. Because the quarterback is so much more important than anybody else in football. And the superstar is so much more important than everything else in basketball. Right, look. Without LeBron James, the Lakers are the you know one of the five worst teams in baseball, yeah, in basketball. and they still have another great player. Right, but they still they'd be awful, even now. Right, you look at the, you look at the Celtics. They lose Jason Tatum, their season's probably over. Chalk it up, right? And but that's just not the case in baseball. In fact, and obviously I'm not trying to say this team's as good because it's not, but in 2016, outside of Corey Kluber, the the Guardians' entire starting rotation was hurt in the playoffs. On paper, not only did they have no business winning the World Series, they had no business winning any round of the playoffs. But you don't win games on paper. 
That's and, a great thing. And you and they rolled a hot pitcher. Andrew right. Andrew Miller became the greatest pitcher in the history of the game for like three weeks. Right. He was he and Kluber were unhittable. Couldn't hit. And him. it didn't even matter. They had nobody else <laughs> besides those two guys, really. And and that's the thing. So is there a replacement for Shane Bieber? No. There's no legitimate replacement for Shane Bieber. We'll talk about some of the veteran options, but there are no good ones. There's n- zero. All the Guardians' best prospects at pitcher are either on the team, hurt, or so early in their career that they can't help a major league right. team. There is no re- there is no Gavin Williams, Logan, uh, Logan Allen, Tanner Bybee ready to come to the big leagues. None. That guy doesn't exist for the Guardians. And we'll talk more about that later. But this does not spoil opening day for me because, as you said, Earl, everybody's got injuries. Pitching injuries in baseball are through the roof. The Braves just lost their best starter, Spencer Strider. He's the best pitcher in baseball. Now, they haven't said he's out for the year yet, but he's got an elbow issue, and Um, they're shutting him down. So the odds are he'll end up missing the season. Even if he doesn't, he's going to miss three months. Garrett Cole, the second best pitcher in baseball, he's missing at least the first two months of the season, and we'll see. He's got an elbow issue, too. They're hoping to have him back in June, but good luck with that. So there's, there's excellent pitchers all over baseball. Now, I get it. The Braves and the Yankees are deeper teams than the Guardians. They have bigger payrolls. They're better teams on paper. But the good thing for the Guardians is they don't have to compete in their divisions with those teams. They're competing with a Royals team that is better but flawed. They're competing with a White Sox team that's going to be one of the worst in baseball. They're competing with a you know a nice young Tiger team that will probably be with them for much of the season and a Twins team that's fine. But they got their own injuries. They lost their best young hitter, Royce Lewis, He's going to be out for, I think, at least two months. And so, no, it's not going to spoil the excitement we've had all weekend in Cleveland from the women's tournament, which we'll talk about later, and what it's going to be like. It's supposed to be a gorgeous day. We're used to crappy weather on opening day. Yeah, Today's yeah. supposed to be gorgeous. It was supposed to be 70 storms. degrees, partly sunny. It's going to be a perfect, perfect day, and nothing could spoil that. It would be even better if Tristan McKenzie looked like himself today. And pitched a great game. He's going to, because the game got rained out yesterday, uh, you'll have McKenzie. And because of the rain out, everybody got pushed back. So you won't need another starter till next weekend or and so. Think about it. How how important now is Carlos Carrasco? Yeah, to, now, for them. Yeah, he only gave him three innings the other day. But, yeah, he's going to have to give him he's going Now it's like, okay, well, now you, before it was just like, okay, well, you're just hanging around. Yeah. Gavin Williams comes back. You right. Know, we'll figure it. But now yes. <laughs> he's going to be a pivotal part of what the rotation yeah, is. Either him or someone else that we're not thinking about right, right now. I don't, yeah, I mean, and this hot start that they're off to offensively, they've got to continue it. You know, they've got to be without Bieber. Their starting pitching is not going to be as good as we thought. There's no way around it. So the hitting's got to be even better. Um, I like, I like that. I tell you what, I, I'm trying to wait time. I ain't want to yeah. be the Duke and knee jerk. I mean, but I like, I like the Rokio Jimenez uh, uh, defensively. I like him. I don't know if there, it's, they, spe- it's they, could it, be really special. It could, like I, you know, I who was a Lindor and who was the second baseman um, when Lindor was playing? Uh, Kipnis. Kipnis, and you know that was okay. Lindor yeah. was a Gold Glover. Yeah. But you know, I'm not gonna say it's it's, it's Vizquel and Omar, or Vizquel and uh, Alomar. Oh, Alomar, yeah. Yeah, I'm not gonna yeah. say this this that, but I like him. I, I didn't know Rokio was all right. You know, I, you bring up a good point. I think, it, I, first of all, Jimenez is already a platinum glove winner, which means the best fielder in the entire league. Rokio is special defensively. Yeah. I, you know, I for those who may have seen the game on Saturday, they made a couple of amazing... I mean, the Twins only had two hits in that game on Saturday, mm-hmm. but they had a million base runners because there was a lot of walks... And there was a couple of hit by pitches. That glove toss he had. You see that, oh, that, that backwards? Was, I was like, oh, I didn't know he had it clip, like that. Mike, do we? Oh. oh. We don't have that <laughs> clip, do we? We showed the one on Friday. Woo. Of the backhanded diamond. If you, got, if you haven't seen it, what G was just talking about, uh, Jimenez, it's first and second, nobody out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Twins were threatening. It was a close game. There was a ground ball up the middle. Jimenez gets it. He's facing center field. And he flipped it backwards. Crazy. To Rokio, who has to dive, <laughs> keep his foot on and the kept base, the foot and on the bag. Did it. That was crazy. Like that had to be a, like a one percent chance of getting it. I did. I did not know. I, listen, yeah. I, it is funny because Rokio was his name was always mentioned yeah. as one of the prospects. But I'm like, do we play? But they kept putting Arias out there, so yeah. I'm like, well, maybe they don't like him like that. I'm like, this guy right here, his glove work is. <laughs> it, 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 listen, I met yeah. uh, I met um, Rosario. Was, yeah. uh, what's the name? I met Rosario. Yeah, got you know, got uh, I met Rosario. He was decent. 
He was yeah, but he, he was wasn't this he, guy. He no. was a, yeah. a regular run of the mill guy. Yeah. He'll make the routine play. But this man, he could he's special. Yeah. I thought it when they first showed it, I thought he was safe. I, I did. I was too. like, there's no way he kept his foot on the bag. Because I was like, yeah. Right? And then he stretched it out. Yeah. And here it is. Look at this. Oh, guy. nice. Look at this. Look at this. That's Backwards crazy. flip. Ah, Are you kidding me? Ah, with the stretch. He stretched it laying down. I mean, that is insane. Look at that. And to keep his foot on the base. That's crazy. I was like, there's no way he's keeping his foot on the bed. And that's, then he got spiked. That's he got crazy. spiked. He took a spike right in his foot. That look at it. First of all, I mean, that's that's, that's absurd. That's stupid. <laughs> Dang. They he doesn't make they don't both don't make that play. The twins are gonna score in that inning. That is a, that I mean that's just the odds of making that play. And we can get behind that are, are just slim. I Go ahead, Mike. That. Yeah, no, that is truly an incredible play. And before we talk about potential replacements for Shane yeah. Bieber, because the Guardians have to do something to their rotation, a quick reminder that every Monday, UCSS sends out a new newsletter. If you text the number on the bottom of your screen, you can sign up for the newsletter. Steve, you take tag board full. You can show people what the newsletter looks like. Uh, Earl writes a little write-up on the newsletter. There's a couple links to what you may have missed from the week before, a little preview of what's coming. So if you guys want to sign up for the newsletter. Man, we ain't pumping this hard enough. At the uh, bottom of your screen. Cleveland it's is just the place a, to be. I mean, it's just a recap of what we did all week. So. But I'm just saying, we didn't publish that. Like, ain't nobody got no newsletters. I like that. I we were talking Yesterday, about. I was talking to my in-laws who were in town visiting. And uh, I was saying how, and I've admitted, I've admitted this before, my first four or five years working in Cleveland, um, my goal was to get back to New York. Mm -hmm. Not that I didn't like Cleveland. It was just... All I was thinking about was working on the radio in New York. That mm -hmm. was my goal. And somewhere along the line, my goal changed. I didn't get an opportunity in New York early. And then I stopped caring. And now and my wife and I were talking about it. We're like, yeah, we're never leaving here. <laughs> what did, you, what did, you, did you come to that conclusion like over like uh, over like some spaghetti or something? No. Or y'all just chilling? No, like, we, we ain't never going. We knew that. We've not wanted to move for a number of years at this point. Because now we're ingrained in the community and my son's got all his friends. I don't want to, at this point, it would be hard for him if we moved to another part yeah. of the country. Yeah. You know, he's got all his buddies. So I was like, we're never going to, but we were just telling my in-laws about that. They kind of knew. And part of and I was like, I always wanted to get back to New York early in my career. And now I was like, the only thing I miss in New York, and pizza. my wife goes, pizza and bagels. Nope. <laughs> yeah. That's about it. I mean, <laughs> Speaking of missing things, Bull, obviously the Guardians will miss Shane Bieber. Yeah. And I asked you yesterday, give me some potential realistic options for the Guardians to look at, whether it's a prospect, yeah. internally, trade, free agent. Who can the Guardians look at to replace Shane Bieber? In this, so uh, I, I, I think trade-wise, I, I, I think I ruled out trade because uh, unless it's a trade for like a journeyman, you know, a, 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 an organization that has a, a, a possible starting pitcher at AAA that's a veteran where they could trade nothing for it. Teams don't, it's very rare to make a, sig a trade of significance this early in the season. And I think the Guardians want to let the season play out a little bit before they might even consider something like that. So I ruled it out. Um, in terms of their minor league system, I've mentioned it briefly before. There are no answers, folks. There is no, at least no obvious answer. If you look at their, their any list of their best prospects, pitching-wise, first of all, most of their top prospects are hitters at this point. Their best pitching prospect is Daniel Espino. He's out for the year. Their next best pitching prospect, who's not even that highly thought of, is a guy named Joey Cantillo, who is going is, is to be out for two months. He, mm -hmm. he could have been a guy they could have possibly helped him, but he's out two months. He has a hamstring injury. The rest of their better pitching prospects are all pitching in, like, a ball. They're like guys who are going to help him in two, three years. These guys are not ready to pitch in the big leagues. So the rest of their AAA starters are Ben Lively, the journeyman they signed before the season, Xavier uh, uh, Nady, who we saw, Curry. you know. Xavier Curry. Curry. I don't know where I came up Xavier with Xavier Nagy was an old outfielder. Yeah, Xavier I guess so. Xavier Zay Car Curry, who. I always, is, say, I always say he's the black guy that got a basketball name that played uh, baseball. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, true. <laughs> that's true. He's, you know, we've seen him a little bit. There's nothing special there. There are other guys pitching in AAA. Uh, I can't think of this one guy. They have one guy who's was their opening day starter, I think, at AAA. He's given up about 16 runs in eight innings at AAA. I, I don't think we want to see him. So I think the best option, if you want to just try to find somebody maybe to eat some innings that's a veteran pitcher, is to go for the dregs that are left on the free agent market. Do they have any potential to stretch anybody out from the bullpen? I, 
yes, Hunter Gaddis was a starter last year, but he's yep. pitched so well in the pen that I don't think they want to move him because their pen is beat up. So I had a guy, Bull, I was going to ask yeah. you about. Uh, did some research this morning. Yeah. I want to make sure I'm saying his name right. Tyler Beatty or Beatty? Beatty. Yeah. Beatty. So from what I gathered, 2014 yeah. first round pick, 14th overall by the, yeah. by the San Francisco Giants. Never really panned out as a starter right. in San Francisco, but he does have that experience in the starting rotation. He's been great for the Guardians and uh, coming out the bullpen this yeah. year. Hasn't given up no runs. I think he has like, what, seven strikeouts and five yeah. innings of work. Could this be a dude that can come in and help you, like, short term? I, I mean, he's one of the guys they'll consider. I left him out. I should have mentioned him. You he is a guy, though, school. that's been a complete bust, you know, and has never been able to put it together. Uh-huh. And so, but, yeah, I mean, he's pitched well so far. You're right. He might be the guy they turn to. I don't know that they're going to go outside of the organization because at this point, some of the guys I'm going to mention are, have been a lot better in their careers than Tyler Beatty. But they're all at the end of their careers. Now, the youngest guy in this bunch, and we'll save Trevor Bauer for last, the youngest guy in this bunch is Noah Syndergaard, who five, six years ago was a, a, an mean? elite pitching prospect. Yeah. And he had, his first couple of years in the majors, he looked like he was going to be a superstar. Injury and whatever has led to his complete downfall. The fact that he's 31 and doesn't have a job is amazing, considering how highly he was thought of coming out of the minors and how great he pitched his first two or three years in the majors. And he, he was, was here last, last year. last year, part of the Ahmad Rosario trade. Right, yeah, he, was here he wasn't for very good. Not great last year. No, no, although he was better here than he was with the Angels, which tells you because he wasn't good here. Johnny Cueto is still pitching? Johnny Cueto. Now, the guy that intrigues me, besides Bauer, is Zach Greinke. Of course. Zach Greinke is a future Hall of Famer. I need him. He's going to turn 41 years old this summer. I can't wow. And he struggled last year. But as recently as 2022, just two years ago, he was still a serviceable starter in 2022. Now, last year he had a 5 ERA. But if you look at some of the advanced numbers on him, he probably should have had something like a 420, 430 ERA, which I could live with with my fifth starter, the guy like that. He likes to play in small markets. Cleveland's a small market, you know, comparatively. So that's about... Now, he, he only needs 13 strikeouts to reach 3,000 all time, or 20, something like that. He needs a handful of strikeouts to get to 3,000. I don't know if that's if he wants to – he hasn't officially retired. He said he, at one point he wanted to play. If I'm the Guardians, I mean, how could it hurt? Even if Greinke stinks, you're not going to pay him anything. You could always cut him. Two names that should jump out. We already had Syndergaard here last year, yeah. right? Yeah. Greinke, I like. Yeah. And it's the last one, Trevor Bauer. Well, the Trevor Bauer one is interesting. There's going to be some people that are horrified by that idea. Just, yep. like they, just like there were some people that were horrified by Deshaun Watson. Now, we know for a fact certain things Trevor Bauer did. We don't know. It, it, nobody's been able to prove they were non-consensual. But there are a lot of people that even if what he did was consensual are you know, going to be bothered by that. There are a couple of differences yeah. here. The difference is that Deshaun Watson was somewhere else, right? So we, yes. we, we weren't privy we right. never had him in a, on a roster, right, right? Right. We've had Trevor Bauer before. And there's some people in the organization that are going to say, we didn't like Trevor Bauer no. before all of this other That's stuff. Right. That's right. So, you know, you go back and look, at, you know, when he's not able to pitch the whole drone thing, that was, listen, that was crazy. He rubbed a lot of teammates the wrong way. Yeah, just, Unlike Deshaun Watson, Trevor Bauer, not, not that there aren't players that like Trevor Bauer, but he wasn't, like, universally liked no. like Deshaun Watson was. Trevor Bauer was not. He was, he's a bully, and he's a jerk. All that, and I, I can't stand the guy. He is, more than any other athlete he playing is. today, I hate him more than probably any athlete today. And yet, I would leave my personal aside, and if I were a team, I would consider bringing him in. Now, it's a lot of bad PR. There's, I think there's zero chance that the Guardians are going to do it. I don't think he's ever going to pitch in the big leagues again. I, don't, and, I think if somebody was going to sign him, it would have happened this offseason. And having a rookie manager, I, I just wouldn't want to put it on his plate like that. I just that would be a I, tough spot. It, 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 you put him in it already from from that perspective. Um, I, I but I do think, man, for he's a, probably the best pitcher available for, for a guy. Like I was just watching him on, um, I was just watching him on, on on a couple of the reels. Yeah. And this man's this man's arm is just ridiculous. Like some of the stuff he's the movement he gets 
on these pitches. He's like a weird mad scientist, like in, in terms of like, okay, how I get enough spin rotation, you know, just the way he moves these pitches in and out is crazy. And his control and accuracy is, is just <clears throat> stupid too. But it's just like, I can't, I no. Would you do it, Earl? I mean, for me, this is how I look at it. My first, my first course of action would be to try somebody that's already in house, that's in the bullpen, yeah. as kind of like a short term option. Because ideally, boy, what I hope happens is once Gavin Williams is back in the rotation, that Cookie Carlos Carrasco pitches well enough that we can lock that down. But let's say that don't happen, right? Yeah. I, I have all these different scenarios in my head playing out. Like if this team continues to win. If these young guys continue to hit yeah. and, and you see that the people that you're bringing in trying to replace Shane Bieber is not working and he's the best option available, yeah. then you got to put winning above everything else. Yeah, you will have a negative PR hit. Yeah, people won't like it. But you know what? In this world, you damned if you do, you damned if you don't. People are not going to like you anyway. You have to prioritize winning. And if this team continues to win – I think that even with the baggage, if he can help you win, I think the fan base will accept it because that's a the bottom line. They'll, they'll a percentage of a percentage. will, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and to me, that, that's the bottom line. You can't handicap everybody else because of bad PR, especially if you see the potential in this team. I think, um, let me ask you this. Yeah. Um, I, we'll ask Zach about it. I'm sure Zach's going to say there's no way they'll ever sign him. I don't think there's any way they'd ever sign him. But Do, no. uh, do the chances of him coming back and being a terrible dude, what are the chances of that? What are the chances of him coming back being a bad teammate? Being a bad teammate? I, I, probably. Be, be, he'd probably be fine. I mean, because he probably he's, I mean, be heck, he's had his career taken from him. Yeah, like, I mean, I'm sure he, at this point, he'd probably do whatever it took to play. Yeah, right. You never know with him because he's a wacky guy, but yeah. um, I guess he'd probably be a good teammate. I, I, I just can't imagine the organization was done with him. And it's the same front office. I know Frank Cohn is not yeah, there. Yeah, but it's the same. But I, he, I, I'd be stunned, but... On paper, he's the best person to help him, but I, would, I just think there's too much to it that they're not going to go down that if, road. If it's me, I got to. I just keep it. I got. I got to keep it copacetic and keep it uh, all the way 100 and real yeah. across both spectrums. Hey, look, you know, he was not. He was exonerated of whatever whatever it was he was accused of. Um, I thought it was very powerful when he came out and told his side of the story when he you know talked about how he was basically set up and framed, right? Um, but here's the thing, given there's, there's other issues beside that with the same front office. If it was me, I feel like I would be strong enough to handle whatever. And we just going to work it out and get better because I think I like his talent and I don't think he'd be a problem. However, the same people that let him go is the same people that's here. So I right. don't know why they, I don't see why they would. If back. they did it, I would, I'm not, I, there's gonna be a lot of people killing them. I won't be one. I understand why people would kill that move. I get it. Five years ago, I would have been one of those people. I've changed my thoughts on this, as I've talked about a lot with Deshaun Watson. Um, you know, so I'm not going to be a hypocrite and, and, and change the rules and, for Trevor and, Bauer. And, and before we get to this, man, there, yeah. there's a lot of people out there. Listen, y- y'all got to stop, stop with this before we can get to it. Anytime somebody says that they would be okay with a guy on the roster... Oh, yeah. That that ain't got nothing to do with me. Stop putting that on people. Talk about well, you just a condoning or a rapist no, or a I'm pedophile. Not, nobody's keep condoning. that off my name, bro. Yeah. Like, I, listen, I go to work, I go home, I don't do nothing, I chill. Stop putting somebody else's stuff on people. Like I, that move people be trying to make nowadays in the comment section that don't work no more. Yeah, that that is not me. G Bush didn't do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. It don't work no more. <laughs> well, we're going to bring in our first Guardians guest today. It is the one, the only, Zach Meisel from The Athletic. But first, if you're looking to get tickets to the Guardians this season, there is no better place, no better place to get tickets for any game, Guardians, Cavs, Browns, a concert, a show in, in Playhouse Square, than using the Game Time app. The Game Time app is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Ooh. The prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. They have killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee. Game Time takes all the guesswork out of buying Major League Baseball tickets, but it's not just baseball, guys. It is everything. Basketball, NFL, you name it, you can buy tickets on the Game Time app. So make sure you take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Just download the app, create an account, and use promo code LOCKEDONNFL for $20 off your first purchase. Once again, create an account, 
Redeem code locked on NFL, L O C K E D O N NFL for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. And with that, we welcome in the co host of the Ultimate Guardian Show with Adam the Bull, the one and only Zach Meisel from Progressive Field. What's up, Zach? What's going on, guys? How are you? We're doing well, buddy. You excited about opening day? You don't get that excited. You're kind of like Jason. There's not a ton of emotion. I like game two. It's so much quieter, yeah. more relaxed. <laughs> 3,000 people in the stands. You think it'll be better than that? It's, the weather's supposed to be nice tomorrow. Yeah, it is. It's, I was saying earlier, I, I can't remember a home opener where the weather was this nice. Amazing. And the way it worked out with the eclipse, too, we'll actually be able to see it. Uh, it, it works out perfectly. Zach, before we get to opening day topics, we were just having because we we talked about Bieber and we were talking. I brought up some veterans, maybe they could sign like a Zach Renke or Johnny Cueto or something. Obviously, Trevor Bauer is going to always come up. I, 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 in my opinion, there's zero ch- percent chance the Guardians would sign him. Would you agree with zero, or do you think there's any remote possibility the Guardians would consider him? No, I think it's lower than that. Honestly, <laughs> um, look, th- there's no one has signed him yet. And let's not pretend like the Guardians are the only team that needs starting pitching. That's true. So that tells you all you need to know. Then you throw in the fact that this organization had headaches with him for seven years before all the allegations and everything came out. Um, I know people are going to say, well, he's, he was never charged with anything. And he, you know, people can change or grow. Whatever you want to say. An arbitrator still upheld his record-length suspension. And this is an organization where he butted heads with people on the field and in the clubhouse before any of that. And it's an organization that has had, you know, there's the Mickey Calloway stuff. And there's, they they changed the name because they, of the unrest with society or whatever they wanted to say a few years ago. So I just, it's hard for me to believe that a team that has had that sort of outward messaging in recent years is going to go and sign a guy linked to anything like this. Zach, could you see a scenario where they saw, would sign a Greinke or a Matthew Boyd or a Johnny Cueto or a Noah Syndergaard, any of those guys, or, or not really? Maybe if there's another injury, but I just yeah. think you're getting Curry back and Ben Lively they gave a major league contract to. So right. there are options, even if they're not sexy options. I just, you know, if someone is 37 years old and sitting on their couch right now, uh, it's probably for a reason. That's fair. Hey, Zach, talk about what you expect from uh, Tristan McKenzie in this second start. We all know his first start was rocky. And then I'm looking at my phone. As of now, it looks like the Chicago White Sox have not named their starter. Any news on who that person might be? I I haven't seen I, The scoreboard was just showing Garrett Crochet. I don't know where the White Sox are in their, um, their turn in the rotation, so I don't. I don't know if that's accurate or not. I never trust the scoreboard here. I've seen some weird stuff that they've messed with pregame <laughs> on the lineups. Um, McKenzie's the most important player on the team. I, I think I believe that before the season. I think it's tenfold now with Bieber's injury. You need you need starters who Stephen Vogt can go to the ballpark and breathe easy, knowing that person's on the mound. And we saw McKenzie was that in 2022. Um, but obviously he made four starts last season. And he and Bieber were kind of going through similar things with their elbows. You see what happened to Bieber. And if I'm Tristan McKenzie, I'm thinking, uh-oh, am I next? Like yeah. this, this, the, the to- Tommy John is the grim reaper in baseball right now. And McKenzie opted not to have surgery last season. He opted to, to rehab it, rest it. And his velo was down considerably in his first start. So I don't know if that, I mean, he said he feels healthy. His velo was a little better in spring training, especially at the end. I saw him hitting 92, 93 a little bit. So I don't know if it was just trying to pace himself or he got too many jitters in his first start. I don't know. Um, but he needs to be a stable force in this rotation for this rotation to keep standing. Like they, they, Gavin Williams has an elbow thing he's coming back from. You've got guys coming back, being built up after spring training. So they just need right. – <clears throat> you can't burn out the bullpen in April. And – you know, Bieber's injury, given the way he was looking the first two starts, it makes McKenzie just absolutely crucial to their success. You know, Zach, I was looking around um, the uh, MLB, and it's just not just the, you know, the Guardians. Like, 
you know, Tommy John surgery is, you know, up every year, it seems like there's, there's more and more of these. Um, in, in Major League Baseball, do you are they thinking about it in terms of it just happens or is there any correlation to, you know, guys just, you know, wanting that velocity, working on it consistently? You know, there's teams that, you know, you have guys who, you know, throw in the mid-90s, 92, 93. Now they're at 96. You're like, how the heck does that happen? Um, you know, is is – that's something Major League Baseball is worried about because it just seems to be a really big thing, especially with people who choose not to have the surgery first and to kind of rehab it. Yeah, gee, I mean, they're they're terrified. It's I don't want to say it's an epidemic and make it out to be some dramatic thing, but it's you have people across the league who are terrified because there is no exact formula here. And it's not just Bieber. I mean, Bieber was the big news for about an hour, and then the Braves announced that Spencer Strider, who's a top three mm. pitcher in the sport, is headed for likely the same fate. So it's a combination of things for sure, and I think the fact that no one has a clear answer on it is what makes this tricky because every team wants guys. The, the easiest way to get outs is strikeouts, right? If you can just miss bats, that takes care of everything. If you're trying to throw 88-mile-an-hour sinkers – like they did in the olden days, and you're le leaning on your defense and having guys put it in play, that's great. But there's no more – you can't shift the way you used to shift. So that makes those pitchers – life's tougher on them. So you think about everyone – pitchers train year-round. They go to these facilities. They learn to throw harder. They learn to give max effort on every pitch. You're seeing 98-mile-an-hour fastballs and 91-mile-an-hour sliders. You never saw that stuff 20 years ago. The problem is – Doing that is hard enough, and you get the wear and tear on your elbow. You don't rest as much as you used to in the winter. Then you add in the pitch clock, and I, I don't know how much of an effect that's had, but at least you used to be able to throw a pitch 98 miles an hour and then catch your breath for 30 seconds, and now you can't. You're right back on the mound, and 18 seconds later, you have to fire another 98-mile-an-hour fastball. So it's, I think the way pitching has just gone and developed has made pitchers better but it's, it's made it more dangerous I think and I don't know what the solution is and I think you have 30 teams that are really scared that their best pitcher is going to be next because it's nobody's safe. Zach we'll wrap it up with two questions here on a scale of one to ten how much are you buying the Guardians offense being real and what player are you most pleasantly surprised by hitter or pitcher through the first nine games. All right, let me go backwards. I, I'm going to take a – I think there's too many obvious answers for your second question, so let me go Hunter Gaddis. When we came one. up, I think everyone remembers him as a guy who made a spot start against the Astros and just got completely shelled a couple of years ago and yep. wanted to never see him again, and now he looks like a reliever you want to call upon to get that key strikeout. So credit to him for evolving and finding out what he does well. Uh, and that bullpen looks really good, and it needs to be really good, given the state oh, of the yeah. rotation. The offense, I, I, I'm buying it in terms of, I was wondering how they'd stay afloat until reinforcements came. You know, Kyle Manzardo, Chase DeLauder, even someone like Juan Brito or Angel Martinez. So I like what I've seen so far, just that if you add someone like Manzardo, who's got some pop, or DeLauder, who has some pop this summer, like that lineup seems so much better than it was last year. But... I want to see more before I'm really buying into this nine or this 13. You know, can Will Brennan keep this up? Mike's guy. Can, uh, right. can Brian Ropio keep this up? Tyler Freeman. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm half in. Give okay. me like a, a five. But I'm feeling better about where it could be in a couple months. I think it's fair. I'm right there with you. Zach, great stuff. Enjoy opening day. And the next episode of the Ultimate Cleveland Guardians show live tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. We will have it for you right here on the Ultimate Cle Cleveland Sports Universe. Thanks, Zach. All right, awesome. don't stare at the sun, guys. Yeah. Good advice. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Zach. Very, uh, very make sure you check advice. out the Ultimate Guardian show tomorrow with Bull G. Are you doing an Ultimate Brown show today at 5, despite the home opener being a 5-10 first pitch? I didn't. Really, I never thought about that. <laughs> I, you know, I I need a scheduling person. Um, so are you ready for the ultimate tease, G? Yeah. You might have an ultimate Brown show tonight at five. You might not. The only one way to find out: hit if, the like button, hit the subscribe button. Yeah. All right, tune right. in at five ten. See if G Bush is on the air or not. We are less than nine hundred subscribers away from forty thousand, folks. Wow. We're less than nine hundred away from forty thousand. 
and we need your help. We want to get the 40000 by our anniversary, our two-year anniversary, which is what? Five weeks away? Today's May 9th. May 9th. Wow. No, I knew it was May 9th, but today's April 8th. So it's a little, it's about four and a half weeks. We got to get roughly 870-something subscribers in the Let's next four weeks plus. Come on. Let's Come through. It. Let's get the 40,000. So before we move on, we'll talk Cavs in one sec. I just want to give you guys the update on the two polls we put up. We asked, would you be in favor of the Guardian signing uh, Trevor Bauer or not? On our YouTube community poll, 700 votes, 78%. Said yes, they'd be in favor of not surprised, but it will not Trevor happen. Bauer. Yeah, guys, in our YouTube poll from about 350 votes, 63% say yes, 36% say no. So the fan base in favor of bringing back Trevor Bauer. Uh, let's talk a little Cavs yesterday. <laughs> or talk about it today after what happened yesterday. It was a catastrophic collapse versus the Clippers. 26 point lead turns into a two point loss. The final plays down the stretch. Left a lot to be desired. I feel like I've said that multiple times on multiple occasions over the last month and a half. G. Bush, I'll start with you because your tweet kind of put it nicely yesterday, if you want to say. But what the hell do you make of the Cavs right now after blowing a 26-point lead and going 1-4 and four on this five-game road trip? That, that put the nail in the coffin for JB. There's no coming back from this. Um, you know, I just watched uh, something on, you know, people talked about back, back in the day when – you know, you know, they were trying to come up with the nuclear bomb and they had people would get sick by having like radiation sickness because mm. they would just be touching the, the, like it's called a, the, you know, the, the, it's the, the tickling the, ta the dragon's tail. You should go look at it. It's actually uh, on YouTube. Go check it out. But what usually happened is people would touch it and be like, I'm good. I'm good. And they would go away for two weeks and they progressively would get sick and then they get a little better and say, oh, I'm good. And then they just get really sick and be out of here. Um, this game is, is the equivalent of touching um, what we would call the Demon Core. And this is, there's no coming back from this. Um, because when you look at it, it's, it's a culmination of everything that you, 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 we've been talking about for years. And, you know, there's this thing about, you know, with the Cavs, and I've always spoke about it, is, you know, JB and the Cavs always seem to get a little less scrutiny to the Browns. They usually get a little less scrutiny um, than the Guardians. Um, but now there, there, there's, there's no escaping this. I mean, JB Biggerstaff, this is this is a fireball offense. You can't be up that many. You can't beat up, be up 30, 40 points uh, and, and then just, just, just throw it all away. I almost said something else. But the fact that you get down and you get to the fourth quarter and you can't come up with any plays to get a stop, you can't come up with any offensive plays to score and, 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 and you know, kind of stop the bleeding a little bit. And then you can't even inbounds the basketball correctly. And I, I told people and I wrote on Twitter, I said, listen, man, you know, this one is a fireball offense. And I'm going to just be honest with you, man. You know, as a coach, what does JB do well? You, you, you got, there's no extra. I mean, nobody's defending him anymore. There's nobody. I can't imagine a single person defending him left. But see the thing, my problem is this, and and yeah. I and I get angry because we we saw this last year. We did. So this is what happens when when I always say to tell people there's only about five to ten teams that is trying to win every single year. And when they came out with this propaganda, and I'm calling it propaganda, it was propaganda by Kobe Altman, it was propaganda by everybody that was working in an organization. The propaganda was we saw what it was with JB last year when they got embarrassed. Then they come out, oh, 51 wins, 51 wins. I said, oh, they done wrote up the, this propaganda is great. We're going to run it back with the core four. Man, listen, that propaganda just, that just put us right back to where we was, and you're reminded in this game, in this microcosm, this is why JB is a starter coach. He's a good coach to get young guys involved. He's a young, he's a young coach to uh, pat people on the back. But listening to his press conferences, if y'all want to get, get on Stefanski, listen to his press conferences. He said, you know what, the, the, the Clippers kind of caught us off guard. How did the Clippers catch you off guard? How? You was up 30. At some point, you got to call timeout and say, listen, this game we will not lose. Somebody step up and make a play. Earl, I, can, I can't He's do it with these not built people. like that, man. And I've told you time in and time out, man. J.B. Bickerstaff holds nobody accountable, including himself, right? Like, he never gets up there and say, you know what, that was a horrible-ass coaching job by me. He never gets up there and say, you know, my players need to play better. Facts. He continues to make excuses for himself and everybody on his team. 
Attitude is a reflection of leadership. And J.B. Bickerstaff has proven time in and time out that he's not a consistent, effective leader, right? We've seen so many different outcomes this season of the Cavs blowing big leads or getting blown out by teams that they shouldn't be blown out by. You got players out there on the court refusing to shoot the ball. Nobody is held accountable for anything. And it seems like, like that statement yesterday, how the hell did the Clippers catch you off guard? You came out guns a-blazing in the first half and you couldn't sustain that? You couldn't even make adjustments when you seen the lead starting to shrink, like time in and time out. The Cavs have gotten to the point, man, to where I'm low-key detached emotionally. It's like I'm at the point, man, to where I really don't even care no more how this season ends. And that's, that's crazy for me to say that. If it's a first-round exit, it's a first-round exit. Because you're right. You had no business running it back with the core four. You had no business running it back with the same coach expecting a different result. Like, that's insane. That's absolutely insanity right there. So they just continue to show that we shouldn't have faith. They continue to show us that, like, what we thought was different this year is not at all. One thing from Chris Fedor's article after the game last night, I want to read you word for word. And to your guys' point, it feels like, and it's a shame, you never want this to happen, but it feels like there's just a lame duck situation for the Cavs heading to the playoffs. We all know the inevitable for JB, but this is a direct quote from Chris Feeder's article, uh, Chris Feeder's article following last night's game. Quote, multiple players openly questioned the defensive strategy afterwards. They wondered why the Cavs didn't attempt to blitz the scorching Paul George and force someone else to play offensive hero. We have reached the point of the season where we are three games away from the playoffs. And in the locker room following a bad loss, players are now openly questioning why yeah. they did and or didn't make certain adjustments. We, and that's never a good yeah. sign for head coach. We talked last week about firing JB, and, and somebody said, well, what's the point? It's so late in the season. Well, maybe that will create some buzz for the players. Now, guys, I agree with everything you said, G. I agree with everything Earl said. I agree with everything Mike said. Let's not give the players a pass either. Well, they like, they're playing like crap across they, the board. Donovan Mitchell got hurt. The team fell apart. Think about it. The Cavs had that stretch, and everybody's hanging their hat on where they went 18-2. and two. The rest of the season, they're three games under 500. They are not a good basketball team. They, they were a good basketball team for six weeks. The rest of the season, they've been garbage. They're a nothing basketball team. Donovan, don't con yourself into think Donovan Mitchell's staying. He's not. Why would he stay? I, I just, he, they're not better than, I, I just think, I just, I, I don't want to just come out and plainly say it, but there's a reason why LeBron James is still allowed to play in the league. There's a reason why Kevin Durant is still like getting 50 a game. Because the level of softness and indifference on the court oh my God, is infuriating. Yeah. Like, we see these guys. I Like, you watch the Cavs play. You tell me when you see Darius Garland upset, Mobley upset, Allen upset, Struess upset. You don't see him. And the coach stands there like this. Well, gee, yesterday, after the comeback was complete, Steve, take tag board full. But uh, I'm not sure you guys saw this video. Russell Westbrook was this. dancing and taunting the Cavs. The only one who Tristan said anything Thompson. was Tristan Thompson. But and Mike, isn't that always the case, though? Like, if it's, if it's not Donovan Mitchell, it's always TT. Look at that. Like, what did Tristan Thompson do? He, he just he walked just up. But it, it's the fact that he did yeah. something. Like, it's the fact that he did something. Yeah, it, it ain't no big deal in the grand scheme of things, man. But like, he wasn't having it, and you see nobody else on his team that that have that type of yeah. attitude. You talk about when do you see them upset? When do you see these dudes assert themselves? Never. I, I think G is right on the money, man. There's too many players to play with, not just the Cavs. No fire. There's no fire. Like, look at the women's champion. I know it's, and I will see it in the men's game tonight. Like, every, I, I know that's the championship game. It's not a fair comparison, really. But regular season, the NBA just sucks. I find it completely unwatchable. Guys play with no fight, no toughness, no heart. This team stinks. I'm with you, Earl, and, and you're a much bigger fan than I am, but, like, I'm not excited about that. At least last year, I was excited about the playoffs. Ultimately, they fell on their face. I have no – I don't think – I feel like they have no chance of winning. I, I feel like this, and I, this is how I know I'm getting older. You know, I grew up watching Kobe Bryant play, right? That Mamba mentality is real. Yeah, in the grand scheme of things, the regular season don't matter. But all of us sitting on this panel couldn't agree. You could never tell Kobe Bryant that. 
Well, every, and, and every, all the players right, before him. Every single like game him. mattered. We're we're dealing with a different generation of kids, right? Yeah. Like these these young men are not built like that. They not built. They not born in the eighties. You know what I mean? They there are. I'm they, sure they there's some guys. There, there's but, a full, there's a small pool of dudes yeah. that's like that, man. But they don't take this stuff to heart the way that no, they used to. They, it's strictly business for them at all times. That's why I respect LeBron. I, I you know why I respect LeBron because he puts pressure on executives at the highest level. Kobe Altman got an answer for this. He got an answer for this. Like, they just be just be 100% clear. You went out and made the trade. You went and I made a trade for Donovan Mitchell, and you didn't have no, you have no backup plan. Zero. There is no backup plan. So when you lose this dude, Donovan, that's why he keep coming up. Y'all see, I'm not that smart. You keep talking about these core four, core four. You say that stuff so you keep people, yeah, they, we, if we lose Donovan, we still got three of the core four. You're not playing those games with me. I already understand what it is. <laughs> Donovan Mitchell is not about to sign up for this because he look around. He like, dang. You, we got another match player on the team, but as soon as I don't play, it's collapse. Yeah, complete what? collapse. Yeah, like, no, I know they're, they're, they're extremely soft. I, I, I don't understand. They got people in there that look like they have seen a ghost and there's nobody to hold them accountable. And, 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 and you running around like a like a crazed barking dog at these referees. But when your team give up 30 point leads, you're doing this. Just to look, just looking like this, like you, like you wanted a uh, toy soldier. You don't do nothing, and, you, and then you sit up there in every single press conference. Well, they hit shots. Well, I thought yeah. we had good looks. The shots didn't go down. I thought our guys fought. I thought our guys were in the game. We just didn't uh, stop. Stop. Get in the seventies, the eighties, and the nineties, guys played hard every game. Regular season matchups were must watch. When 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 Bird and the Celtics play Magic and the Lakers in the regular season. It was must watch when Jordan played against Isaiah Thomas, when Jordan played against Bird, when Jordan played against Magic. These were must watch regular season games. I just think I remember like NBC basketball on the weekends. Remember that? You'd have oh. the game of the week and we'd all be watching that. Man. Because those guys wanted to beat the other stars. Man. Now it's all nonsense. What do y'all think it is though? Because like you're talking about, you know, the seventies, eighties and nineties, yeah. early two thousand. Like, is it is it something about the generations that's changed? Like, what, what is it about how players used to play with so much more passion, so much more want to back in the day? Like, basketball was more than just a business. It was more than just making money. Like, I, I know Kobe was built different, and that's why I use for an example, but it was a lot of players that had that mindset. They took this game seriously. I, I they used, cared. These, yeah. It just don't seem like these dudes got that same type of get up and go Those about themselves that the players back in the I'm, day. I'm gonna ask you, Big Nuggets, because this this is I I played basketball in high school, right? And there was a level we had two football players, me and my dude Antonio. We played football, but we also played basketball. So by the time the state championship was over, they had already been playing basketball or whatever. So we understood, like, yo, they already been shooting. They already been doing their thing. We got to come out here and be physical. <laughs> like, we're going to muck the game up a little bit until we get into basketball shape, right? And, and there's, there's something that happened. Back when I am, I mean, this is 98, 97. This is, this is around the time when, when AAU first came around. AAU first start, start dropping. And what AAU did was it made people elite. Like, you became an elitist. Like, I remember people who would play in high school, right? They wouldn't play with their high school in the summer. It's like, I'm doing AAU. Then they started playing AAU, and then be like, well, we're not going to play basketball on the street. We're not playing pickup games. We don't play games in the neighborhood. We play other teams and we travel. It gets to the point where I remember just, you get to college, and you got a bunch of kids that is just like, they, they, they brother-in-law the, the drill. they like, oh, there's no physical play. There's guys that are gonna be like, yeah, let's go around and dunk the whole game. Let's shoot threes. But but in, in total, McNuggets, maybe it's just me. But back in the day, if you was nice, you played everywhere. Ryan Rosillo has been saying this for a long time. The skill level in the NBA has never been higher because every player has a personal trainer when they're 12 years old and they're working on individual drills. But no one plays real basketball. And part of the reason the one and dones in college don't work, and part of the reasons in the NBA you see less team cohesion, is everyone is so individually talented and they've done things in their own respective way since they were 11, 12, 13, whenever they get these personal trainers, that it doesn't mesh in the same sense it used to. And we still have the women's game. We'll talk about it in a sec. Yeah. 
South Carolina replaced four of their top six players from last year, but they played nine. They play great together. Yeah. Iowa had been together for four or five years now. There's a team element that you can't replicate. Right. And, and even though individual st- uh, skills yeah. are an all-time high, more guys can score 20 points. The dribbling, the shooting, never been better. The team cohesion and the ability to win, G, doesn't come as quickly as it used never to be back been in worse. the 90s, 20s, and 2000s. And- and think about it, Mike. First of all, there's, there's other elements. We got Jay in one sex. We got to wrap you up. You look at the foreign players in, 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 in Europe and stuff, they practice way more. Like in AAU, how often do you practice? Once They're a week. They're just playing all that. games. I played in, AAU for four years. We practiced yeah. once a week, and we played eight games a In week. Europe, I was hearing, I don't know, it was Popovich or somebody saying, like, they practice three, four times a week, and then they play one or two games. That's it. It's a different mentality. It's right. Different. And part of it is, um, this is where analytics is a bad thing. A negative uh, is all these nerds, and I'm a, I'm a pro nerd guy, but all these nerds in basketball, they want the guys to not play as many games. It's it, that's like the basketball culture now, and as you said, that's how you learn to be tough is playing street ball. You, 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 that's how you learn no no blood, no foul. You got to be tough, mentally tough. And to bring it all together, you know, McNugget said it, and I think you you got to this point when you talk about cohesion, and you know, guys are are individually talented, yeah. but LeBron spoke to this point. You got a lot of people wanting to play one-on-one, and they really don't know the fundamentals of basketball. They don't know the fundamentals of playing the team as a team. You know, they're great individual players, yeah. and it's hurting the product. It is. I I, I think the product's the worst it's ever been. I, I'm, pro- I'm probably in the minority there, but I don't like it, and I loved the NBA when I was a kid, but not anymore. We're going to bring Jay Crawford in one sec. I just want to make sure people understand we didn't talk about the final inbounds play that the Cavs drew up Too last good night. Good gracious. We don't have time. We'll get to it later if we have a chance. But you want to criticize? We talked about JB. Big picture I mean, there. Does it matter at this point? Individual yeah, minutiae things you could pick out as to why last night did not work. We're going to bring Jay Crawford in here from Progressive Field after a quick reminder that today's show is sponsored by BetterHelp. What's the first thing you do if you had an extra hour in the day? Go for a run, take a nap, read a book. Show up for a friend? Well, a lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. The question is, time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know it's important to you and make it a priority. And therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do it more often. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule, all you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn today for 10% off of your first month. That is BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOn. And with that, let's welcome in Jay Crawford from Progressive Field. Jay, very impressive there looking live shot there. Great seat for today's home opener. How you doing, Jay? I'm great. Happy New Year, guys. Everybody is thrilled about what's going on with the Cleveland Guardians, with the exception of the loss of Shane Bieber. Yeah. Seven and two. Bull and G, we talked last week. What would be yeah. the number of wins it would take to really get you excited? We had said six, seven, eight would break the bank. And then all of a sudden, the Shane Bieber injury happens. And gosh, you could just feel the air leave the, the room when the news hit. And now, guys, the big question is, What are the Guardians going to do to cover for the loss of Shane Bieber? Gavin Williams' injury has kind of uh, delayed his start to the season, so he's not coming uh, in the immediate future. Um, Xavier Curry had a nice uh, start down in Columbus. It looks like they're trying to stretch him out a little bit, so maybe he could be another starter. For now, it's Carlos Carrasco, who I don't even – I don't know how to describe his his outing Saturday. Bull (laughs) – (laughs) <laughs> when when do you see a team combined for two hits? Yeah, but you never felt comfortable in the game. They were walking everybody. His yeah. pitch count was high. So I don't think he's a long term answer. I don't know where they go, Bull. I really don't. Yeah, we were taught, you know, like obviously Bauer's name comes up, but the Guardians are not going down that road. I brought up the Zach Meisel guys like Zach Greinke and Johnny Cueto. I, I don't know if those guys can help anymore. If you look at their pitching prospects, they're. They're, they're only two pitching prospects above a ball, really, are Espino, who's hurt for the year, and Joey Cantillo, who's out for two months. The rest of their good pitching prospects are, you know, they're pitching an eight ball. They're not ready to, to contribute. So there's no obvious answer. But, Jay, even despite that, and, and as devastating as the Bieber injury is, 
we kind of we're feeling the excitement of the opening day in seven two. How are you personally, as a massive Guardians fan, balancing that excitement opening day, excitement seven and two versus you know how much this injury hurts? Well, you know what you do, bull. You you compartmentalize it, and for me, I've just sort of put away the Bieber injury for today. Yeah. Um, I, watching the game on Saturday, you kind of had a sick feeling in the pit of your stomach that, you know. As much as you want to get excited about a 7-2 and two start, you know without your ace, things are going to get dreary at some point. Now, I'm watching with fascination today, Bull, yes. to see what Tristan McKenzie does. Because yes. as you know, in his first start of the year, he was not Tristan McKenzie. He, too, had some elbow issues in the offseason. He, too, like Shane Bieber, decided to opt away from going for the surgery. He yes. wanted to get back to the field sooner. Whether or not that's going to blow up in the Guardian's face and, and Tristan's face or not, we don't know. But when you look at the velocity that he was throwing with in his opening start, that's concerning to me. So no I'm doubt. going to be looking at the radar gun to see what he can top out at. And, I mean, gosh, what's crazy to me, Bull, is in watching Shane Bieber every pitch of his first two starts, there wasn't an inkling to me no. that yeah. there was anything wrong, which really speaks to how much of a gamer he is. He went out there in his second start, and he had to be in pain. He had to be. Yep. And yet, you never would have known it. He went out there. He looked great. He struck out, I think, nine guys in, yeah. in, his, in six innings. He had 12 Ks in his first start. It just it, it speaks to the v level of toughness that he has. But next, I'm kind of holding my, my breath with Tristan McKenzie because if they lose Tristan McKenzie, too, it's a repeat of last year. Remember, yeah. last year they lost Beaver and McKenzie early on, and that was pretty much the season. They cannot withstand losing Tristan McKenzie like they did last year. It would be a devastating blow to this team. You're, you're right. Jay, um, you know, I can't help but look at, um, in the background, um, how does the, the renovations look? Blue um, seats look awesome. Yeah, like, I, I think they look I, awesome. It look, it look crisp. Now, now, am I correct in saying they did remove some seats? Uh, they did bring the blue seats back. Uh, how are the renovations overall looking for you? Yeah, so what they've done on the lower bowl is all the seats now are blue, with the exception of a small number of seats down the left field line and a small number of seats down the right field line. This, remember, from the beginning, guys, was a two-year project. They knew it was going to take two years to completely renovate stuff. Now, one of the interesting things, and I'm going to have to move my camera here so you can see it. If you look over my shoulder here yeah. in the right field seats, mm -hmm. do, you notice, do you notice now... I got to get it. I got to get yeah. the angle right. It's open air now in yeah. right field. Where That's the, awesome. Remember those shipping, those shipping containers are gone. And Bull, That's the great. first thing I thought of when I walked in, I'm going to watch to see how the ball carries out to right field today. Right now, the wind is blowing to left field. But it's going to be interesting in the future to see what happens to balls that get up into that at atmosphere. Because now, without those... Without that wall being solid in mm -hmm. right field, the wind will no longer swirl. It will jet right through that opening. And I'm thinking that you could see a much higher home run total to right field this year by all players. I, I, the Guardians obviously are still kind of home run challenged. But yeah. that's going to be interesting to see how that is affected. But they also painted all of the cement uh, on the lower concourse. That's pretty much was the focus of what they wanted to do this year. They added a couple of bars. It seems to me like, and Bull, we've talked about this, baseball is almost becoming the, the sideshow. Yeah. You know, they're, they're having yeah. all these other areas where yeah. folks can congregate and hang out and enjoy the beautiful weather and drink beer and, and, and whatnot. Um, but a lot of the changes, I'm told, the cosmetic changes that fans will really notice when they come in are going to happen after this season, into the offseason. And then when we walk in for opening day 2025, it's going to look much different in here, I'm told. So we'll kind of see how all that shakes out. But really, it's interesting. You've seen a smattering of players coming out, going through some pregame running. But because opening day has been pushed back to 5 o'clock because of the eclipse, it, it's going to be – activity down here will be very light and very slow until probably around 1, 2 o'clock. Then it will pick up. I can't wait, guys, to see how these two major stories come together here today. At about 3.15, when the totality of the eclipse hits, I think that the, one of the shots that will go viral across the country 
is when you have 50 ball players on the field behind me, 25 White Sox, 25 Guardians, all with their solar eclipse glasses on, looking up to see the eclipse. And I'm told from the folks at NASA who supplied the Guardians and all of their staff with the uh, eclipse glasses that the White Sox actually reached out to NASA and said, hey, can you send us a big batch too? Our folks want to watch it as well. So that's going to be really interesting to watch these two major stories converge in all day today over on Channel 3, beginning at 2 o'clock. We're going to be in eclipse coverage from 2 until 3.30. Then we'll shift gears after the eclipse and go to Guardians opening day coverage from 3.30 to 4. Then from 4 to 5, the Bally's pregame show will air on WKYC because WKYC has the local broadcast rights for a certain number of games in the market. So at 4 to 5, we'll carry the Bally's pregame show. And then at 5 o'clock, we begin game coverage, which will carry, obviously, all the way through the final pitch of today's opening day. So it's a big day, a lot of excitement. And um, hopefully, that right now, it's all sun. Hopefully, the clouds stay away. Yeah. They're supposed to move in in the afternoon. Right now, if the eclipse was to happen, it would be absolute perfect viewing. So we'll see if it holds. When was the, la- when was the last time you could remember opening day 70 degrees? Crazy. Yep. It is crazy. It's been a while. I've been here at opening days where there's been snow in the air. Of course. So, you know, this is a blessing. Now, if you take a peek on the calendar and you look at, I believe, Friday's forecast is low 40s and rain. Yeah. So, you know the deal in Northeast Ohio, Bull. If you don't like the weather, wait 15 minutes. It'll change. In this case, wait a couple days. It's going to change drastically. But at least for now, it looks like the weather gods have smiled on progressive field. There is, around the stadium, a huge buzz of excitement. And, Bull, I can tell you, they're going to open the gates here in a short while to fans. They're doing it earlier because the, uh, the, they want people to be in place so they can see the eclipse from inside. Right. But all around the gates, all the way around Progressive Field, there are huge crowds waiting to come in. And I can't remember – I've been to a number of opening days here in a row now. I can't remember a time where I saw crowds that big – waiting to get inside six hours before first pitch. Yeah, that's awesome. Great the atmosphere today. Go ahead, Earl. Jay, what up, man? So uh, the Guardians' uh, young lineup, man, they got off to a hot start, hitting the ball well. They had a few days off, of course, with the, with the weather delay yesterday. What's your expectations for this Guardians lineup in this first series at home against the White Sox? Well, I got to tell you, and Bull, you know this well, This the lineup has outperformed everybody's early expectations. Oh, yeah. Now, we're not even, you know, we're not even one sixteenth of the way through the season, you know. So it's we don't we want to, you know, pump the brakes on that. But the one thing that you look at that really jumps out, and this is the stat that you have on the screen right now, is run differential. That's kind of the the apples to apples comparison between the leagues and, and and amongst all of baseball. And right now, no one has the run differential that the Guardians have. And if you would have told me that nine games into the season that would have been the case, I wouldn't have believed it. Now, remember, when I came to you guys live from Surprise, I told you that I felt, and it was one of the things that you can't measure with a statistic, I just felt that there was a real buzz in this Guardians clubhouse. There is still a buzz in this Guardian clubhouse. In fact, my biggest fear was they were going to get off to a slow start and that good feeling would dissipate immediately. But it's going to be a real test to this clubhouse now how they hold together in the wake of the uh, uh, the, the Shane Bieber injury. Because I firmly believe that team chemistry and camaraderie can overcome a lot. It's not going to make up for a bad team. You've got to be a good team. But that camaraderie and that chemistry can carry a good team to become a great team. It It can carry a great team to become a historic team. And I think it's more the good team to the great team with this club. But, Bull, the hitting has been there. Yeah. They've had clutch hitting. Andre Jimenez at second base has been an absolute wizard. Jay, I mean, he speak- just makes one great play after another. Speaking of which, let us I, I was going to wrap it up with you. Uh, Andre, that play on Saturday, I, I assume you oh. watched it. I know you That play, the flip, and then Rokio diving and keeping his foot on the base. We were talking about that before. Mm. That was incredible. Unbelievable, Bull. Yeah. And for you yeah. to see that... And now remember, what, what the second base shortstop combination is very, very tricky because, pardon the pun here, but they work hand in glove. And when you don't have a lot of reps together, 
Yeah. There's a certain there's a certain something that's missing, particularly on on difficult double play turns. But Jimenez and Rokio look like they've been playing this position together their whole lives, and it just really speaks to the level of athleticism and skill level that these guys have. Rokio has stepped in at shortstop and hasn't missed a beat, and Freeman out in center field has been, I would say, above expectations. He's been very, very good. There's been a slight drop-off from yeah. Miles Straw, but you would expect that. The guy's a gold glover. But I think Freeman has a very, very high ceiling in center field. And, Bull, every great team is strong defensively up the middle. You have to be. Yeah. And it looks like this Guardians team is going to yeah. be just fine defensively up no the doubt. middle. So if the bats can stay hot and somehow they continue. The bullpen, by the way, on Saturday, despite issuing one free pass after another, they worked out of jam after jam after jam, thanks yep. in large part to some great defense behind yeah. them. But, you know, look, this thing could have legs, and let's just let's just take it to where it leads us. But right now, there's a lot of excitement around this team, and I think this is a team, despite losing Shane Bieber, I know it's going to be more difficult now, but I do think that they still could contend for the division title. Jay at the beautiful progressive field, which looks amazing. When, when Jay first popped up there for a second, I was like, why is Jay Yankee Stadium? It kind of looked a little like Yankee Stadium to me for a second with the blue seats. And, it's, the blue, and, it's the blue seats. And the opening yeah. up in the right field, which I love. I, nice. I love it. I love the way the place looks. I can't wait to go to my first game. I think I'm going to try to go next weekend. Jay, great stuff, man. We'll see awesome. you later in the week. Enjoy. Guys, we'll see you. Take care. Go, go Guards. Right. Go Guardians. Look good. Uh, Thanks, Jay. Look good in there, It man. does look good. I like, I like the That's open airness. I, the worst thing about Progressive Field to me was those those big green the shipping containers. Yeah. Shipping and they hadn't been there that long, but that was an awful decision. I'm glad they got rid I of it. I think them. the fan experience at Progressive Field oh, as as is top tier. No you, doubt. You, you don't get no better than that. Even for a casual baseball fan, there yeah. is nothing like a summer night inside that It's ballpark. beautiful. A warm day, just it's great. It's a great experience. Blueberry beer and hot dogs. There you go. And if you're looking to get a ticket to Progressive Field or a Guardians game or a Cavs game or a Browns game or a concert or a show on Playhouse Square, you better be using the Game Time app. It is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster and easier. And the best part about Game Time, the prices actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. They have killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from their seat, and the lowest price guarantee makes Game Time the best and most reliable ticket buying option on the market and takes all the guesswork out of buying tickets too, which is a big help. So make sure you download the Game Time app, create an account, and use promo code LOCKEDONNFL for $20 off your first purchase. You can see the promo code on your screen right there. Terms apply. Just create an account, redeem the code on your screen for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. On last week's Friday show, we showed you G. Bush at Lefty's, which is Deshaun right. Watson's new cheesesteak cheese restaurant in Cleveland Heights. Earl the Pearl was also there. We'll get you the full video and the food review, I think, on Wednesday, G., yes, after sir. Rashad's done editing that all for us. But also at Lefty's that day was a taping of the QB Plugged on podcast. That's Deshaun Watson and Quincy, Carrier, uh, Quincy Avery, excuse me. That's their podcast. And Kevin <laughs> Stefanski was a guest on the show. And... Deshaun had some comments on Kevin Stefanski that caught my eye. Let's hear it, and then we'll react. And play when you're ready. Say this. I'm going to give you your flowers live, Coach. Oh. The things that, that you do for the organization, for this community, but for the locker room. The guys talk about it every day, talk about it all the time. I think that is a, a, a big testimony to what you and AB is doing for this organization, for this community, and it's something special. And we talk about it in the locker room, and I think that's why you know we go out there every Sunday or whenever we're playing, and we give you 110% because you treat us like men, you give us our flowers when we need to, but also you push us hard enough to go out there on the practice field and compete. And then once we get out there on Sundays, it make it a lot easier. Well, I appreciate that. And as you know, you know that locker room, is that's you. That's right. you guys. That's not my locker room. I trust uh, the leaders in our football team. Uh, the things that you do in that locker room, I, I think it gets lost on people. Everybody sees what goes on on Sundays, but, man, there is so much hard work. Think Definitely. about in the meeting room, in the, in the weight room. I mean, that, that is so much that leads up to those games on Sunday. And I say this, I'm going to give you your flowers. Well, I thought that was about as ringing endorsement as a quarterback can give his head coach. What say you? Yeah, that was a very eye-opening uh, moment for me. Um, I have, I've had this sense 
lately, in the last few months, that maybe Deshaun Watson had been frustrated by Kevin Stefanski or maybe frustrated with the situation, whether it was Joe Flacco or him having to play more under center. And maybe maybe he had something to do with Kevin Stefanski potentially losing his play calling. And it was, you know, I, I, I didn't know that. I, I'm not saying I knew that to be the case. It was just a feeling I kind of had about the situation. And to hear him talk about Kevin Stefanski. Now, it's easy to say, well, oh, he's being a phony. He doesn't really believe that. But what I, what I would say is, if he didn't really believe in Kevin Stefanski, he would have still said something nice for him coming on his podcast. But I don't think he would have gone to that level. The way he talked, Deshaun Watson is not an actor. He's not a professional actor. He's a football player. He couldn't have gone, like the way he talked about it, that's real. And how do I know? Because I freaking know. That's how I know. Because I can, I can read people. And you could tell when an athlete's being phony or a coach is being phony. And he was not being phony there. I'm convinced of it. I'm 99.9% certain of it. And I like that he praised Kevin Stefanski to the point where it's like, okay, Jimmy, let's finalize this contract here because look at what your quarterback just said about your head coach. And that's what you want. And that's what we've never had here in Cleveland, or at least never had it in, in modern times. And and so that was good. I I, I uh, listen. I, I'm not. Gonna, it's pretty obvious. I'm. Da- I've been down on Deshaun Watson uh, for a couple of months now after being insanely excited when they traded for him and insanely excited in the first season and insanely excited going into the second season. I'm a little down on him right now. I don't feel as confident that he's going to turn it around. And it's just words. It doesn't really mean anything in the grand scheme of things. But for the first time for me in a while, I felt a little, I, I felt a little better about Deshaun Watson. I think body language, energy, and passion never lie. So I totally agree with everything you said. You've seen his body language. You can, you can see the passion. You can feel the energy. Um, shout out to Deshaun Watson. Shout out to everybody that was at, at the event in University Heights. Uh, it was a great event. But for me, when I, when I heard these comments, I watched the entire podcast. The entire 15-minute segment of him and Stefanski going back and forth, we'll go watch it. Phenomenal content right there. I've always had this idea that the reason why I really appreciated Kevin Stefanski being the head coach of the Cleveland Browns is, is because he's a leader of men. And I feel like that's the most important attribute or intangible that any head coach can have. I think when you get to this level, right, NFL, your coach, your head coach, I think that everybody that's that's in those rooms and in those conversations, you might not be the greatest at the X's and O's, but you clearly wouldn't be where you are if you didn't have that skill set. I think we all can agree to that. I think the fan base, sometimes us in the media, we get too bogged down on the X's and O's or the situational play calling. But I can't remember too many times that this Cleveland Browns team is not prepared, no matter what the outcome of the game is. We've seen and talked to a lot of players that play for Kevin Stefanski and this current team, and it's a close-knit group. But the one thing that always stands out to me is all these dudes play hard for Kevin Stefanski. And that's a sign of respect. It, cl- it clearly is a two-way street. He shows them respect. They show that respect back in return by going out there and busting their ass for him every single game, every single day in practice. And when you just look at the Cleveland Browns as a whole, I think Kevin Stefanski plays a pretty significant part in a culture change, you know, that has taken place here. And you just see, like, so many different players, not just Deshaun Watson that's willing to give this man his flowers. And, like, kudos to him. You definitely need to like, get that contract extension done and get it done quick because him being a leader of men is, to me, way more important than the plays that he's calling on his play sheet. Gee, it's funny. We're waiting for uh, J.B. Bickerstaff and Kobe Altman to get fired, and we're waiting for Andrew <laughs> Berry and Kevin Stefanski to get a new contract. Well, listen, yeah. <clears throat> it, it, hey, it ain't always been that case. I've not. been, I think I've been the biggest Kevin Stefanski detractor probably in the city. Like, I, I mean, I was, you know, like, yo, I, I was like, yo, you got to get rid of Joe Woods. What are you doing with these D tackles, Andrew Barry? But what I like to do is, yeah, I can, as much as I, you can call people out, there's also times where you get an opportunity to see people what they're really about. And to just deduce it down to a regular, just a man-to-man level, um, I was at the event and I was watching and, and seeing how he was moving. 
And uh, he got a lot of, I, I gained a lot of respect for him, and, and namely because of this. He didn't show up to re- get his Coach of the Year award, right? His second one. He, didn't, he wasn't at the event, right? And um, I'm like, man, that's kind of crazy. You didn't come to that? That's, that's weird. Like, most people, that's the pinnacle of the coaching career. And the fact that, like, people like me have always said, like, yo, Coach Stefanski, play calling, this things, he's had his detractors. So you, normally people will show up and get that award and be like, now shut up. Shut up, G. Right. Bush. I told right, you, right, yeah. don't even worry about what I'm doing. I got two of these trophies. You know how I many people don't got one? I got two. But he didn't show up for it. Like he didn't. He's like, I don't really care. Not one, two. He could not but one, but two, <laughs> two, two of these things, two, two of them doors. And guess what? He pulled up to Deshaun Watson's opening of his story because he understood how important it was to support his quarterback. And I got a lot of respect for him because he didn't have to show up to that. Not only did he not have to show up for it, he didn't have to be on the podcast. Not only did he not have to show up and be on the podcast. He didn't have to go into, and, 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 and buy no cheesesteaks and, and take pictures with, with, with people. By the way, my, my wife was, I apologize, Coach Fancy. My wife was being a creeper. She took a very <laughs> close picture of your beard. It's like this crazy. I said, bro, get over here. How, do, what are you doing? Do you know women in this city? Absolutely. No, no matter the race, women love yeah, Kevin course. Stefanski. So when we, when, when, when we seen him grabbing his lefties cheesesteaks and yeah. uh, ushering home, me and G was like, his wife called, said, you better get home right now. <laughs> right. You'd have been out in public too long. That's right. He, and he <laughs> came in, he showed up with the people. And that means he has a level of awareness. He understands that that Deshaun Watson rocking the Glenville hoodie too. Yeah, he had the Glenville hoodie on too. Knew he where he's at. He and he came through and said, "Look, yeah. I know, I know y'all like Joe Flacco. I know y'all like Flacco. But listen, let me be clear. The Cleveland Browns organization is fully behind Deshaun Watson. And if there was anybody that didn't think so, that's on you. But I'm gonna show up for my guy. And sometimes it's just, it's not about." It's not about how how much you do something and what you say. It's about what people do. I had a birthday party and everybody came. Right? Yeah, everybody like like I mean I was no, there. Bull was there. No, no, Bull like was there. the whole city came. Like I was just like yeah. I was like. Now guess what? Most people don't come to stuff unless it's your funeral. And they might not even come to that. Mm. So I think that means a lot for Deshaun. And I you can see it in his energy. He feels like people now are behind him. And now he can really let, let, let's go. Let's play some football now. Yeah, this is the year. And uh, yeah, I think that was really a positive thing for both coach and player. Mm-hmm. It was so funny, like just being there and like me and G was there the entire event. There's a video of my Instagram of me talking to Deshaun Watson off, off camera without any yeah. of this content we took. And everybody kept asking me, like, what was you saying to him? Because he looked really engaged. I kind of keep that to myself, but. I can say this, just being in that environment, talking to the people that I talk to, you know, being around him, getting a chance yeah. to have a conversation, perception versus reality, reality when it comes to him is totally different. And I got to admit, you, Jay, and Jason are right. You know, for us who live in this Twitter universe, we think it's the end all be all or that certain you know, section of the population, their opinion is the only opinion that matters. But like just to hear and just to see firsthand the love that this dude gets in the city of Cleveland, you know, his his people talked about how he's always in the city. And like I even talked to somebody that's a part of his team, showed me like a list of stuff that he's done in the community that us in the media, we've never heard about. You know, he's never been disrespected out in public like he gets a lot of love here. And to to know that it felt good to know like this city is really behind this dude and they really supporting him. Meanwhile, it's not the real world. It's not the real world. We sit up here thinking like, okay, like this is what everybody feel. But no, it's not like that at all. It was a lot of love out there. A lot of smiles. A lot of people taking pictures like him signing autograph. Like it was just a great experience. And to see the coach, to see the media and the fans pull up and show support for Deshaun Watson. Second and 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 this is the big thing I took away too. And, And a lot of people in the media might not know. So on this show, when we talk about, you know, Deshaun Watson and what he's going to be, we talk about the ups and the downs and, yeah, I need to see a certain level of this. I need to see that. But you know the crazy thing that stood out to me the most is his whole family was like, oh, no, 
we watch the show every day. Shout out to Tyreek Watson, man. That's his little brother. He watched the show every yeah. day. Me and G sitting there, we eating. He come up, tap us on the shoulder. He yeah. gives us some T-shirts. And he was like, you know, I appreciate you. I watch the show every day. And we like, yeah, cool. He like, yeah, I'm Deshaun's little brother. <laughs> <laughs> and he's watching us That's every cool. day, so thanks, yeah, yeah. man. And like you know, we had, we had a conversation as well. Like he he, a fan of the show, man. And it, it's just it's good to see that support. We appreciate it. it yeah. definitely I'm is. a little disappointed when Earl was giving credit to everyone about not living on social media. I had to be the first person to tell Earl. <laughs> right. Social media is not the end all be all. Earl just let me hang it. I've been there for Earl. Why? Earl, I McNuggets, I say, is, McNuggets is the therapist. I gave him a seat yesterday at the, at, the, at the championship game. I did and see no y'all. love in the turn, man. Come on. I, now, said, I love you, bro. You know this, man. I said a long time ago, like, and I still get occasionally pissed off by something on social media, even though I know it's stupid, because I have people that get angry at me all the time. And I've met fans for. Uh, what, 13 years now in Cleveland, I've only had one bad interaction in 13 years. I've had hundreds, maybe a thousand, I don't know, good interactions with fans. Even though, you know, sometimes you think your social media, 20% of the people hate your guts. Yeah. That's not really. Hey, I, you know, your mama, she going to keep, keep she going to make sure that you ain't talking about it. Oh, his, his mom was a sweetheart. His, his mother came up, and as soon as we came up, he's, he's like, can, can you take a picture? I said, That's cool. let yeah, me tell Adam the Bull they don't hate him that much. What, one other thing for that <laughs> podcast that I thought was pretty cool, Mike, yeah. I'm pretty sure you watched it. It was cool to see Kevin Stefanski kind of relax and take us behind the scenes of some of the things they talked about. Like, we talk a lot on this show about halftime adjustments, right? Yeah. And Kevin Stefanski was like, man, if you're waiting at halftime to make adjustments, you already behind the eight ball. And he talked about that him and the coaches, they're all kind of interacting on the headsets five minutes before the second quarter ends to get their plan together once they get in the locker room. And how they got like a lot of time. They got five to ten minutes to spend with these players. They automatically huddle up, bring the whiteboard out, get their plan together for when they come out in the third quarter. And you just see, man, the organization, right? Just the constantly thinking ahead. There is so much about Kevin Stefanski that I absolutely love. They like nobody's perfect. No human is perfect, man. But I'm just glad he's the Cleveland Browns head coach. Well, it's a good that you. It's really good that you guys went. I know it was a great experience for you guys, and it seemed like it was a great thing, like all around. Looks like an awesome place, and uh, that's great. And I'm, it's really cool that they watch the show and they know that I think that for the most part, when there's been criticism and there's been plenty of criticism in the last six months, that it's not coming from a place where I want him to fail or something like that. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah, we, and, and we yeah. got plus, let's not get it twisted. Like, this is the way they got a job to do. We got a job That's to right. do. That's right, 100%. <laughs> I and you a, can't let your feelings for a player yeah, affect right, how you do your job yeah, or because you want to be friends with a player or whatever. You got, you got a job to way. do. I mean, still need 4,500. Let's go. Let's go. Go ahead, All right, Mike. guys, you know today is the eclipse, so if you're traveling around Cleveland, make sure you guys be safe, take the necessary precautions. Avoid traffic if you can, and if you look at the sun, wear the glasses. That can be dangerous. Yeah, Tyvis. What is Tyvis yeah, doing? Tyvis is. What did he say? He said he's going to just look into the sun. Hey, hey, listen, Tyvis. Man, you are, Tyvis hey. also said he can hit a softball. <laughs> Tyvis also said he can play golf. He Tyvis. took all of the glasses I offered to everybody, and then isn't going to use them apparently. Right, yeah. Man, so listen. just know, be out there, home opener. It's going to be a yeah. blast. So make sure you guys get out. Ty- Tyvis from the hood. He first. used he used to live in life on the edge, man. Bro, he's this, crazy. this is how Tyvis rock, man. He was from the hood 100 years ago. And Tyvis now he lives in the deep suburbs. <laughs> the deep I mean, come on. You, you can take him out, but listen, we know how Tyvis he is, man. The deep No sub- matter what time, Tyvis well, is going to be gonna Tyvis. You're going to glasses, aren't you? I'm not even really thinking about the eclipse. Hey, I got a show hey. to prepare. I'm hosting the night on the radio. I got okay, a show to you prepare can for. Step you. outside for five minutes and hey. put on your glasses. Hey, I'm going to get something to eat. Hey, I'm hey. going to get a nap. Listen, <laughs> hey, black folks, yeah. don't do it to yourself. Don't. Hey, listen, don't be – I don't want to see a bunch of Ray Charles's out here, bro. <laughs> don't, don't, she don't. She gets the money. D- 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 <laughs> what nominee? Don't well, do the, it. In, in honor of the eclipse, <laughs> and as, in case anyone knows, the eclipse is when the moon blocks the sunlight. It's going to get dark in Cleveland. I put together a list of the ultimate five blocks that I know of sports history. I'm sure there's plenty. They're probably all for the last six plenty years. Plenty way down the line, and if I, I miss them, you guys can tell me what else. This is – McNuggets top five blocks that I know of in Cleveland yeah. history. So this is the first top five we've done in a while. Uh, I think this is going to be fun. Slacking. And are you guys ready? <laughs> the number five best block yeah. that Mike McNuggets knows of was from week one of this NFL season. Wyatt Teller blocked a member of Bulls' beloved Cincinnati Bengals. 
20 yards downfield. If you forget this play, Anthony, this play. let's take tag board and play this block. We going full? We Wyatt tag board Keller. full? Yeah, this is tag board <laughs> three quarters. <laughs> oh, come on. Hey, son. <laughs> hey, son. Get off the block. Oh, and he finished you off. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> he, he topped him off. Pause. Pause. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. 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 That was a hell of a Hey, that was a hell of a pause that moment. That's one of the all time that's, all a, that's, that's the ultimate pause of the day right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. The ultimate pause of the day. All right, can you top that uh, no, that block? <laughs> Come <laughs> on. Five. Gee, would you like to uh, address the, the media real quick after I, that statement? I, yeah, I, 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 listen, I wanna, uh, I, I'm ashamed. I want to <laughs> apologize to the academy, my <laughs> friends, and my Lord and Savior for uh, coming out here saying some of the craziest things that I've ever said. That was mm. crazy. Mm. All right, so number five was Wyatt Teller. Number How four, is that only five? How about Cedric Tillman? You guys remember when he lit up Kyle Van Noy during the oh, yeah, 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 game, yeah, yeah. during the comeback, that 14 for 14 second half? If you missed it, here's the play. We have it from two different angles. Boom. Laying the hammer <laughs> Wasn't that a penalty, Kyle though? No, it wasn't. Oh. It wasn't. It was not a blindside block. Ironically, Kyle Van Noy retaliated and got flagged. Yeah, right. so not only was it a great block, <laughs> he did. they also added 15 yards from the unnecessary roughness you penalty see, afterwards. In, in my opinion, we used to call that a the Wyatt pipe. Teller block is a million times better than that. Because yes. Van Noy didn't see him coming. He, he didn't see him. Whereas right. Wyatt Teller was engaged. He was engaged like, you push him down. That was like the blind side. Where, Can you imagine Wyatt what? Teller running at you like, oh shit? Yeah, I mean that was crazy. Hey, listen, you got made. You I don't got like your order. He should have just fell. He should. He, he just right. get down. He he Play dead. Yeah, Something. Like, Remember that scene in the Blind Side where he ca the kid's a racist kid. Remember? Yes. Yeah. And he just grabs him and he blocks pushes him into the stand. Throws him over the fence. That's good. Uh, by the way, that's I mean, that's what it, that was kind of like good. what that play was. All right, so those are the first two. Five was Wyatt Teller. Yeah. Four was Cedric Tillman. Yeah. Now, this next one's a little off the radar, but this was a block that was heard all across the Twitter land. <laughs> when Deshaun Watson blocked Nick Carnes on Twitter. <laughs> In my opinion, since I've been here, this that, is without a doubt that's the third <laughs> yeah. block in Cleveland recent history. That, Nick, listen. It's funny. Nick is Nick, such a we nice guy. Nick. We, we don't say him. we love him. I don't love him. I don't even know him. <laughs> He's hysterical. He like seems Nick. like a nice guy on Twitter, but he has some of the most annoying tweets. And, but here's the thing, though. Yeah. Here's the thing, though. The crazy part about it is... Like he's like he's he's that dude like on Twitter. He has a whole bunch of people that came after Deshaun Watson. I, that was and, crazy. And then Deshaun Watson was like, they was like, look at the soft flex. Deshaun Watson actually followed Nick. Yeah, <laughs> like, I couldn't believe right. that Deshaun Watson had blocked him because Nick only says good things. I think it was an accident. Nick he's is the like ultimate Homer. He, he's the nicest guy I've never met. Yeah, he he really really. I got to meet man. Nick. He was, I, 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 do, I admit, Nick, said, I find you annoying said, sometimes on Twitter, said, but know, I like you too. I love he, him and hate he him. He said, do you know how many crazy DMs I got because I know, of you? I, know. I, I lost half my family. Up. I'm like, dang. <laughs> hey, we should invite Nick up here to come watch the show. Well, one day. I don't know about that. Bull was always talking I don't know about that. Wait, he said you're taking too far, no? All right, let's invite Nick. Nick. All right, I'm with him. We are big Nick Carnes fans. I enjoy all the stuff he puts out there. Some of it's a little crazy, but Nick's the best. All right, number two. Happened this season when Miles Garrett blocked the field goal against Indianapolis. When he hurdled an offensive lineman that to block good. the field goal. If you missed it. We named this the second best play of the season for the Browns. Just an incredible feat of athleticism. We'll see it again here on the replay. But there's maybe one or two people in the entire world who could do what yeah. Miles Garrett did on this play. Gene, I, don't under, I don't understand. How you, only, I don't under, how you have no basketball. Clip. I, I, I don't, better be number one. I don't understand how this is not a play from now on. Like. Like, did he? Because I first, I'm like, did he jump over the center? I thought you couldn't jump over the center. You and then they're like, but yeah, you yeah. can't catapult. You can't right. propel. And he didn't touch nobody. No. And he was just like, yeah, give me that. I mean, how many NFL players can actually do that physically? Not many. No, I, no, there, there's, they, there, there's, it's there's a, a lot. It's more a, than, it's a, yeah, more than you so. think. More than you think. Now, who has the, I'll always say, you know, superstar is where creativity meets God-given ability, right? So you got to just think of it like, yo, I'm about to get this. A lot of people wouldn't try to do that. No, that's true. You know who, yeah. used to probably, who could do it probably back in the day? Javon Curse. Oh, yeah. Or, 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 or what's probably the all the elite. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I'm sure uh, Michael Parsons. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's definitely good. Matter of fact, there's a lot of people. Everybody, as long as you can box jump uh, a certain amount. All these guys, all these guys are jumping at least over 36 inches. 
Jason Pierre Paul, when he was coming out for the draft, had that like fifty inch box yeah. jump jumped out of a pool. Like I, I do think do, there are super athletes, but the top I, I got a three, three six jump. Not three six? Three inch three point six inches, yeah. <laughs> I actually don't know if I can even jump that. Up. I don't know how I feel about talking about inches. Hello. So let's just yeah, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> Man, uh, and the number one block. better be the obvious one. <laughs> it is the obvious one. It is LeBron on Iguodala in yeah. the finals, the game saving, game clinching, maybe the most iconic play of, play of LeBron's career. I don't know what is more iconic if there is one, but this was arguably the greatest block in NBA history, and it had to be the number one block every, in Cleveland. History. Every time I look at it, I can't still d- decide whether it's a good block or not. <clears throat> like, if I look, some days I look at it, I'm like, that got to be goaltender. Some days I'm like, I can't believe he got to it. But, like, it's just... Well, whether it... Was it goaltending? No, he nah, definitely got there. Nah. Definitely but got even there. if it had... It's still, like, how did he get there? The incredible Which part is, is where he started the play and how much ground he tracked yeah. in the last three steps he took to catch up to Iggy, to be able to rise, yeah, take it off the top nuts. of the block. This is the top of the block. This, this, is man's, not a face, this man's face is by the rim. Was J, that was JR right there, right? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Well, I gotta, just, it's like JR wasn't even there. I got an honorable mention. Mike, yeah, add him in. I told you, I definitely missed Mike, the Mike, I need y'all to watch the chat for this, fellas. Fellas, this for y'all, fellas on the set. Mm. Honorable mention block, right? You ever have a girl go all the way all all the way off on you via text? Like she say some crazy shit, like just go totally off the rails, and then you go to respond and you realize she blocked you. Blocked. Yeah, she just kind of get her funky it's never off and then she blocked you. I don't know what you're I, doing. I, you, I, you, honorable <laughs> mention block. Listen, uh, listen. I, I had to block somebody on the radio today. I had to dump them all the way out. We had a bunch of people. Obviously, they're not used to talking about women's basketball, women's sports. This dude called me up. No names, please. No name, please. He starts off the conversation like, "G. Bush, I've been watching these. Ooh, I've been watching these games, and uh, I've been watching how they just out there moving." And I'm like, "Okay." He's like, yeah, then I started looking at this, you know, that girl from Iowa. I said, Caitlin Clark, she he like, no, uh, Gabby Marshall. I was looking at her eyes and I was mess. I said, whoa, she <laughs> does have, whoa, I like her eyes. I she said, what, what else? What else? Yeah. Yeah. I, listen, I'm just trying to like, yeah, man. She just like, listen, she's just, uh, he was going too far, bro. He yeah. was going way too creepy. far. He talked about the Jersey, yeah. you know, the Jersey. Oh, little, yeah. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. We we'll had to block you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're real out. quick. You so how out. was the top five list? Well, how did I get up out of here? It was a good <laughs> list. I just would have had. I would have flip flopped Wyatt and uh, and uh, Cedric Tillman. And it's kind of, in a way, like you shouldn't have Cedric Tillman on there because he's such a slappy at this point. It's an insult to the rest of the list. I just love how this, gra- this is the like best graphic we've ever made. This is a great graphic. <laughs> this graphic just looks awesome. The Deshaun and- Watson blocking Nick Carnes. Is one of the greatest things you've ever put in the top five. I mean, that is hey, that is well done. Mike. The chat is going crazy. <laughs> he said, "Creep." Somebody said I had to go follow her on <laughs> said, IG. She <laughs> said, "No, nah, they talking about no Gabby bad, bro. He wasn't lying." Listen, she's wild. <laughs> Somebody said, "I heard you when you had to drop him." I said, "Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. We yeah. we can't do that." I know. I, I even got a text when I was there Friday. Like they like, who was twenty four? <laughs> Caitlin Clark was 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 winning, but I was like, they, somebody was like, who's that? She from Ohio. I said, oh man, let me talk to him. Oh, uh, what's the girl from? Well, one of the South Carolina girls from Ohio. One of the I'll women look, on the I'll South Carolina team is from Dayton. She's from Dayton, Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. Which one? I forgot. I think she it was Raven. Know that Mike. Mm-hmm. I know Gabby Marshall was. She's famous. No, one of, I think one of the South Carolina <laughs> players. South Carolina roster, Ohio. Uh, Samika Walker is from Columbus. And Bree Hall. Oh, Bree Hall. Hall. Bree Hall, yeah. Right, Bree Hall's from Dayton, yeah. Anyway, let's talk about the women's fight. First of all, it was a great weekend in <laughs> Cleveland. The energy in the queue. I wasn't there, but it just felt like it on TV. Mike, you were there. Were you there, Earl? I was there. I was not there for the championship game. Okay. Yeah, I, I see you on Instagram. I said, man, these producers, these bull. They're getting hooked up? These producers got some uh, inside hookup. Yeah. Well, they, I, I'm watching they Earl on the, on the Instagram joint. I'm like, where is Earl at? Yeah. He's signing autographs and he went to the game? Yeah. <laughs> it was unacceptable, The man. atmosphere was electric. Crazy. It was, so, I'll let Earl chime in Friday because me and Earl were there together Friday. He didn't make it on Sunday. The first game, South Carolina. And, gee, we asked if you wanted a press pass. You said no. You man, didn't answer the text. None of this. I, I had one. Hey, you, you, had pass, hey, you, hey you had one. You asked this man 50 million times yeah. if he wanted a press pass. He could have had one. And he said, huh, what you mean? 
<laughs> what you mean? What you talk? A press pass? What you talking about? You know, so, Friday, right. the first you did it to yourself. You could have been there. Yeah, that's on you, G. I don't feel bad. Uh, but yeah. Earl, on Friday, the first game, South Carolina, NC State, I'd say about 70% full. Tickets got June for both games, so there was definitely a portion of the fan base that just wanted to see UConn, Iowa. It's a good atmosphere, but once the UConn, Iowa game started, the late game on Friday night, the way that went back and forth, coming down to the call at the very end, or, I mean, you tweeted it out. You thought it was louder than it is for some Cavs games during that last five-minute sequence in the final four. Listen, game. Friday night was amazing. Like, I, I get to the games with just walking to the arena, getting inside of the arena, seeing all the people with their kids outside doing all the different activities, like how clean downtown Cleveland looked, you know, like how smooth everything went getting in and out of the arena. You get to the arena, the atmosphere is absolutely bananas, right? You got Iowa fans pretty much taking over Rock and Mortgage Fieldhouse. You know, we get to our media seats. That was probably the highest up I've ever you been. You could not sit behind us. We were the last <laughs> wasn't, no yeah, sitting, right. wasn't no sitting behind us. Yeah, we, I saw we, that picture you took of the court. <laughs> we appreciate being in the building. Yeah. Though we were literally the last row. Great. Yeah. But, you know, you get there. One of the coolest things is me and Mike got a chance to meet a lot of people that was not from here, that was in the media. I know for me, like, I'm still new to this. So to meet all the different, like, minorities, that that's around this country that's in the sports i'm like man that's yeah. cool like that's dope you you get to the games the first game south carolina north carolina state north carolina state come out very aggressive they come out hungry and then me and mike in real time watch don staley do what don staley does she makes all the proper adjustments they come out what third quarter 29 to 6 run yeah. yep. to close out the third so we seen her dominance her team's dominance pull on full put on full display the nightcap, man, it was like a like a pay per view main event at WrestleMania yeah, or something like that. That was a like great that. game. Like you, you, you get Iowa, you get UConn. I don't think Caitlin Clark had ever been defended the way that she was defended by UConn in her entire career. Yeah. Like she was being face guarded every single time. At one particular point, she had more turnovers than she did points. You know, but you see her. Me and Mike talked about this this morning. For as great as a shooter she is, I think that she's an even better passer. Like her court vision, her basketball IQ is absolutely through the roof. And we were treated to a show. Unfortunately, the refs played a part at part yeah, in I it. I think in the end, during like, the I end, think it was the right call. Also it was. Run. It just blows it just that. Hurt, you, know, you that, wanted to see a game with yeah. her, potentially game winning shot. So it, it was cool. Yeah. Uh, being able to just to be in the press rooms, you know, to be up close and personal with Don Staley, I'm a huge fan of hers. To be up and close and part, uh, person with Caitlin Clark. Uh, Mike didn't notice. I kind of wandered off on my own and um, went to the UConn locker room. Yeah, like, oh. even though that they lost, got a chance to see Paige Beckers. And one of the coolest things is you see Maya Moore. She was in this room. I could see her through the crack of the door. Yeah. She was talking to some of the players that was coming back next year about, you know, yeah. UConn basketball and just it's going to be okay. You get another opportunity to be here. But yeah. it was great, man. You know, um, the one negative <clears throat> on what was an amazing weekend and we do this too often in sports, but for some reason it's really bothered me. It was like people were tearing down Caitlin Clark after the championship game. You know, and, and like you don't have to tear her down to build up to build up South Carolina. Agreed. Like, we Agreed. can show love to Caitlin Clark and South Carolina at the same time. Clearly, South Carolina was a was a way better team, but most people like me who haven't watched a ton of college women's college basketball or college basketball period, we didn't know how good South Carolina was. And it was like the people who knew how good South Carolina was, was like ready to, to shit on Caitlin Clark and shit on any fan who thought they would win. Like, why? So many people right now are embracing women's basketball for the first time ever. And it's great for the sport. And I loved that, that after the game, Dawn Staley's comment. Dawn Staley, talked about how Caitlin Clark built up women's basketball. Why be a hater, guys? Hey, listen, man. Why be a hater? What is wrong with people? You know that's how it is, man. You know, cats been waiting. Cats been waiting. See, here's the thing. Yeah. They build it up, right? So it's it's, it's, it's the good versus evil thing, right? So she beat Angel Reese. Yeah. Then people clown Angel Reese. And he's like, come on, bro. And that's and that's week two. And then and then so she that, won. And yeah. then then now South Carolina is they got their get back. I, I, because you, I, right. you you do know that right. if you vote for if you root for LSU, you root for South Carolina. You do know that, right? I hear you. And I know <laughs> I know this I get it. There's always a racial component to all of it. But this. it don't make I don't no think sense. this is as much race as 
some people want to make it. I think with this in particular, yeah. there's a lot of great women's basketball players throughout the years that did not get the type of attention they felt they deserved. So right. to see Caitlin now, and listen, she deserves all the flowers why she's gotten. If you want to get mad at the way the coverage is, that's fine. But to put it on her is I, stupid. I agree. And that, that part unfair. Of it's unfair. That part is completely unfair. And I just think that's the bigger picture of how this whole situation unfolded. Yeah. People took their anger out at Caitlin Clark. When right. Caitlin Clark has done nothing but be, uh, frankly, a shining example of how you should hold yourself. Yes. The coverage of it, I have, I have issues for other reasons with the coverage. I think they did a disservice to some of the other great women's basketball players throughout the years. And now other players in the past are, frankly, a little jealous that it's Caitlin who's getting the attention. But you go back to the NBA. I mean, who's the old NBA player that said Steph Curry couldn't play in the 90s? Oh, it's like, all it, kind of old This heads. happens in every sport. Right. Yeah. It, uh, the older right. guys, the gatekeepers, don't appreciate and don't want to recognize that the next generation yeah. could be next up. So Caitlin this is not Clark has been great for the sport, exclusive. whether you whether you like her or not. <clears throat> it's stupid to be a hater. For me personally, yeah. I can sum up her college career in one word. She was evolutionary. That's who she was. Like the way that she took women's basketball, and to me, not just on a collegiate part of it, but what she's going to do for the WNBA. She took it and she put it on a whole much larger scale. Now she has some help doing it. I think a lot of the pushback comes from people are calling her the greatest player ever. And if you're calling her the greatest player ever, in my mind, you're being disrespectful. That's just my opinion. That's just that. That's just my opinion. Disrespectful is that, not fair. Just hear me out. Yeah. <clears throat> When you got Cheryl Miller, when you got uh, Lisa Leslie, when you yep. got Cynthia Cooper, when you got Diana Taurasi, when you got Rebecca Lobo, when you got all these people. Wait, you saying you can't but, make a case for her? No, what I'm saying is, Don, what I'm trying to say is yeah. Don Staley said it right. She's one of the goats of our game. And so when yeah. people, people sometimes, like when they hear you talk direct and literal, they take you for what you say. When you say she's the greatest of all time, the pushback comes like, wait a minute. No, she's not. I know some people that balled out like her. Yeah. But what Caitlin Clark did for the game of basketball, college women's basketball, like, it's, it's, it's evolutionary to me. Like, she's an amazing human, yeah. an amazing person. I love her competitive, competitive nature yeah. on a court. Like, just – and it's, she's not just a shooter. Like, she, right. she has an all-around game. Right. She didn't finish with no national championships. So, that right she there is – good enough around her, let's face right. it. Right. You know what I mean? I mean so, like – I get it. You got the Maya Moors. You got a lot of yeah. people out here who, you know, didn't get the love and attention that they should have gotten during yeah. their time. And the joke is on them. Like, to me, I get it. It's a popular thing now. But, man, I, to, a lot of people late to the party. Well, yeah, well, but to me, but a lot of people late to the party. Here's the thing. When, anytime you have a, a sport where it's predominantly African-American dominated, like the best players are usually black people. When you find somebody that comes along, that comes from the opposite. She grew yeah. up in Iowa, in the middle of nowhere, but she comes up and she she goes. She's playing on a, on a team, just basically an all white team. Yeah. But she has the game and the trash talking and the bravado and unapologetic. That's what it makes it so crazy. Because think about it like this: when golf was all white and Tiger Woods came along, right? The fact that Tiger Woods was black was part of the story. Of course. Because it, well, he, but she's not the first great black player, a uh, white player. No, but she was yeah. the first white player that was playing with that energy. She she had the energy. Like she who nobody is no one before her was doing this. No one before her uh, was talking I mean, trash. Or waving. And, 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 <laughs> yeah, I, ain't nobody doing that. And she played yeah. at a different she played at a way where it was like, and she was pulling up from half court on you. Right. So the game Yes, race plays a part, but the style of play plays a part. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the temperature of what the climate was plays a right. part. And people being like a large group of people that are saying we're not represented in a way. Like when you say the best players are all black, yeah. people are going to gravitate towards her because they're like, wow, this person rep this person represents our, our life. Sure. So that's sure. a big part of it. And there's right. nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I, I don't – to me it's not – listen, I don't know enough about – I didn't watch Cheryl Miller play. None, none of us watched Cheryl Miller play. She played too many years ago. Do I know that Cheryl Miller is better than Caitlin Clark? Maybe she is, maybe she isn't. I have no idea. I'm not qualified to answer that question. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's disrespectful. If you're a knowledgeable women's basketball person that knows the sport and knows the history of it, mm -hmm. and you think Caitlin Clark's the best player of all time, then you're entitled. It's an opinion. There's no fact 
to who's the best player of all time. Because she brought you to the table. No, it, no, no, no. No, no, no. What I'm yeah. saying, though, is... But that's not what I'm saying. She, I'm talking she, about people... I'm talking about people that know the sport. Even if you don't know the sport, right? And yeah. you just started watching because of Caitlin Clark. And you ain't never watched no WNBA. You ain't never watched nothing. Right. But you saw her play. To some girl that's 11 or 12, she's the greatest of all time. Facts. Yeah, and that's fine. Facts. I don't think it's disrespectful. I think... And if you're going to say it's disrespectful, I think it's disrespectful to people say, well, she can't be the greatest because she didn't win a championship. Well, that, you know, I mean, that to me is stupid. There's only a couple of years to win a championship. South Carolina was a wagon, too. I mean, like a wagon. You could, you, they got, listen, they got balls. Again, I don't know well enough, Mike. You watch more women's basketball than I do. I don't know how long you've been watching it. I've been watching women's Mike, basketball for over 15 years. It seemed to me that even though Caitlin Clark was the best player in that game yesterday, that the next nine best players are on South Carolina. Carmilla, well, certainly nine of the next ten. Carmilla right? Cardoza is a monster. Yeah. That, good, that girl is she's like he was killing their bigs. Get she's gonna be here. a top three pick. Like she's is she? elite. Right. Elite but Kaylin Clark was still the best player. Right. But South Carolina is the best team. You, you couldn't have got. Listen, it couldn't have been no better. Yeah. You had the 2024 Naismith Player of the Year yeah. versus the 2024 Naismith Coach of the Year. Right. Like shout out to Kaylin Clark, man. Nothing but love. But before this show ends, we have to give Don Staley her proper due. Like, I've never seen Don Staley get emotional. Like, and Don Staley is one of my favorite yeah. coaches to follow. I hope and pray that my daughters can play for her one day. But to see her get emotional and to talk about uncommon favor, you know, she talked about out of all the star players that has came and went yeah. since they organically built this program on South Carolina, and this be the team that go undefeated and win a national championship. Yeah. This is our third national championship putting her in rare rare air. Now she's one of only five coaches ever in the history of the game yeah. to win five, I mean, to win three of them. And you look at all the players that's coming back next year, it's just, this is a powerhouse that's going to continue to, yeah. you know, do what I they do. those two freshman girls. <clears throat> yeah, they did. Were both awesome. They did their thing. They definitely did their they thing. Were, I mean, it was a fun game to watch because – they, Iowa didn't quit. They kept making little runs in the second half. You they cut it to it, five or like four minutes left. Too. But but it, South Carolina was too much. Just uh, Cardoza was just too much. I mean, it, she was unstoppable. It's just, it's and they couldn't. The, 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 the O'Brien girl or whatever yeah. her name was was too slow. And the other girl it just was too small. It, yeah. it was the other it, big when girl. You watch she it. looked so tight. In the other games, she looked bigger. But against uh, Cardozo, that girl looked tiny. You and, couldn't do nothing about it. It, yeah, it, it was, was it was levels to it. Like I like I, I was explaining to <laughs> I was explaining to my my wife. She's like, why 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 do you think South Carolina will win? I said, well look, bro, those girls from Iowa, except for Caitlin Clark, they're gonna be school teachers one day. <laughs> <laughs> the mother yeah. girls, they they gonna be teaching but, English yeah. at a local high school. But and uh, God bless them, they played their are heart out. Any of the girls on Iowa besides her gonna play in the WNBA ever? I think Hannah can. Stolke, maybe. She's got two more years left. I think Hannah Stolke can. Yeah, but she got her ass kicked yesterday. She, she did. Yeah, she, I mean, she, she's a huge she's a, she's a power forward, not a she's, center. She she's probably their actually. second best player. That but other girl is a good player. Um, Kate Martin. They, they had some players. Stolke's the only other one who was even a top 50 recruit. So right, Caitlin right. Clark was top five recruit. Stolke but was South top Carolina, 50. like all their players, the nine that played – all seem like like WNBA players, no? And and I, maybe not all of them, but yeah, they're all most of them. One thing that one thing that I really liked about Don Staley is yeah. she said like I got I got relationships I got real relationships with their parents. She called their parents. And that was an interesting. She thing. calls their agents. She, she calls she their talking AU about that. coach. She said crazy. outside of talent, yeah. the second thing that she pay attention to most is the level of respect that these these yeah. student athletes have for their parents. Because if they respect their parents, yeah. you know they'll come here and they'll respect us. One last point. Yeah. To me. It seems like Don Staley is out there playing chess while everybody else is playing wow, checkers. You still got a Pagino number one. Just hear me out. Just Gino watching. It, I mean, Gino too, but just yeah. watching. Just watching her say like, "Okay, I'm gonna watch what this team doing. Yeah. Let me see what you're doing. Give me your best shot, and then I'm gonna come out here. My team is gonna make the proper adjustments, and we're gonna run you, run you out the house." Are you moving her past Gino? No, not no. Yeah. Hell no, you can't she, do that. She moved, she the two What's her now, name? Right? Raven Johnson. Yeah. Okay, Raven Johnson, a girl that Caitlin Clark waved off last yeah. year, she called just a revenge tour. She did not have the best game offensively. Yeah. But what Dawn Staley did after Caitlin Clark dropped 18 points in the first yeah. quarter, she made Raven her primary defender. Caitlin went 5 of 20 for the rest of the yeah, game. Yeah, she didn't shoot well in the second For the half. rest of the game. Uh, gotta get super Go ahead, Super Chats. Uh, Trizzy T said we traded for Cindergard last year. It did not go well. Monty Berry, who no was kidding. defending J.B. Bickerstaff in the chat all day, says, G, keep that same energy when the playoffs start. 
Roberto El Presidente said, Bull, mu uh, Bull must not see Monty in here defending JB. When you said no one defends JB anymore, Monty Berry in the okay. chat yeah, yeah, he, he, is, uh, well, is defending one, him. One lunatic. Halim Youssef says, Kevin Stefanski's lack of ego is one of the most impressive things in sports as far as coaching is concerned. When Jason says it, believe it. It's the catalyst to his success. Our guy, Dank Nasty Ass Masters, back. He said, Good. who are we sacrificing on the pitcher's mound at the moment of totality to guarantee a World Series this year? <laughs> what was the beginning of that? That's crazy. Who are we sacrificing uh, on the pitcher's mound? Who are we sacrificing on the pitcher's mound at the moment of totality to guarantee a World Series? Trevor Bauer. And Mud Alou says, experience eclipse totality is incredible. It gets so cold. Earl, please take the time to experience totality at some point in your life. Astronomy rocks. Yeah, I'm annoyed by people like Earl who are like, I'm too big. I'm too cool. No, I never said I was too big or too Get cool. Get your glasses and watch. I, I said I, have, you? I got a show tonight, 7 to 11 on 92.3 The Fan. I need to be prepared so that show. I can deliver. You can That's what I'm focused on. To watch 7 to midnight? 7 to 11. Okay. There's seven no more 7 to midnight. No more midnight. Really? Yeah. It's and a David brilliant Fry, move by the fans. David Fry, your starting three hitter today for the guards. See you. No See overtime. you tomorrow. No overtime. Peace.